Hey there, friends. I do apologize that I've been somewhat absent recently. Uh, no video on Friday, and today it's going to be a comp. As you can probably tell, I'm not feeling the best, and as I've posted on Twitter and on my community tab, uh, speaking is a little rough, and I don't think you'd want to listen to this for an hour. <laughs> I wouldn't, so... Um, no word of the week this week, obviously, since it's a compilation, so if you want to go back to last week's video and leave a word now if you haven't already, a sentence, I mean, uh, please feel free to do so. It'll be in next week's video, assuming that I'm doing better. I, I assume I will be, I'm just saying. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just wanted to pop in here and say, again, apologize for the lack of content these past couple days. I don't like breaking or deviating from my normal schedule at all, so it's kind of kind of killing me inside, but yeah. Anyways. Uh, these are the glitch stories from December and January, uh, all those glitch videos that were in those two months, so hopefully you enjoy them, and hopefully I'll see you on the next video, which should be Wednesday, again, assuming I can talk better than this. <laughs> Anyways, uh, have a great day, friends. Remember you're loved, you're valid, you're important, and of course, sleep well, and enjoy these glitch stories. Let me say that I have too many freaky things happen long before I knew anything about glitches. I'm talking like 40 years ago. But as a kid, memories and events are perceived in a way far different than the adult mind. I'm not saying that they're false or unimportant, just saying whenever you get older you learn and gain experience. Well, some do. I've experienced so many glitches within the last ten years that it seems to be gaining momentum. I think once your eyes are open and you experience something like this, you have two choices. Turn a blind eye, ignore it, and find any way to dismiss it, or the other option, which is to embrace it and strap in. You need to be prepared because... You may not get a second chance to return to that ignorant bliss of denial. This was my way of seeing it until recently. It seems if you keep going down the rabbit hole, it can affect others close to you. But it seems that others can be dragged down into that rabbit hole with you. Like, for instance, in the one glitch where my friend who I was on FaceTime with was a witness. Now... When I was younger, another friend was directly involved. They chose to opt out. Although one doesn't deny what happened, he totally refuses to talk about it. The other admits to it, and simply doesn't care or think about it. Now comes my closest friend who passively is involved with many of my glitches, although she wasn't directly involved nor a witness. They took place in close proximity. At the very least, she is the first one I tell after I do experience something. That is, unless I experience something at her house. Then I don't usually say anything. Because it freaks her out. She's the kind of person who opts out of this stuff. She knows it's a thing that some people believe, but doesn't know if it's real, psychological, spiritual, or just Twilight Zone stuff. Either way, unless she is directly involved and an eyewitness, she's pretty much my Agent Scully. Now to the glitch. I've been staying over at my friend's house while my house is being renovated. I'm a night owl on most nights. I'm up until 2.30 or 3 a.m. sculpting, drawing, just making something. It's my compulsion and my stress reliever. I would have to say spending time with my goddaughter is number one on my list of things that brings me peace. The second is my quiet time doing my sculpting while listening to narrated stories on YouTube. Also, everything and all things to expand my mind. Quantum physics, cosmology, history, and so on. Well... Just this week, I was doing a late night project. I was listening to YouTube on my phone, and it just goes dead. Totally shuts off. 
it wasn't full battery, it was on around 30% when I last checked the time at 1.53 or 1.56 a.m. It shouldn't have died minutes later as it did. It has that warning chime of low battery. It's at like 15% and then at 3%, and neither one went off. Within one, maybe two minutes after my phone died, there was a really bright flash of light behind me. I was in a well-lit room, and it was bright enough to make me jump and squint my eyes. I turned around really quickly, and nothing was there. The flash of light was so close to the back of my head, it was as if someone took a picture with the flash on while holding the camera an inch from the back of my head. I don't jump to wild assumptions, regardless of what some assume. I went against what I experienced and saw, and I just went to the logical conclusion. It came from outside a window, a few feet behind me, but I can actually debunk this idea. The window was about 95% closed with the shade totally closed, and a big box fan. In front of the fan, there are a bunch of sculptures. To add to that, I was on the second floor. A car's headlight can't reach that high and be that bright. In order for light to penetrate a closed window through a closed shade and a box fan, and sculptures, and still be that bright is impossible. The other possibility is that it was a neurological or optical illusion. Okay, I thought. I'll go with that. Well, that explanation ended when my friend told me what happened at around 2.10 or 2.15 in the next room that same night, minutes after that flash. Now, bear in mind... I didn't tell her about the flash because of my standing rule that I mentioned earlier. Don't tell her stuff that happened in her house. That will freak her out. But this is what she told me. She was up, on her phone, and talking to a family member that was going through an emotional trauma. My friend was sitting up in bed with her five-year-old daughter next to her sleeping. My friend then saw two orbs floating around the room a few feet from the foot of the bed. Now, I asked direct questions, so I have a detailed description of the event. My friend saw them and did what she does in a situation like that. She ignored them, acted like she didn't see them. She said she didn't react, didn't do anything besides talk on the phone. She said she thought she was seeing things or that it was all in her head but then she heard her daughter ask mommy, what's that? My goddaughter woke up and saw it as well. My friend said, just ignore it and go back to sleep. They floated around for a few minutes and then disappeared in the blink of an eye. The description, there was two of them and they were independent of any surface, so they weren't reflections or light being cast from anywhere, onto anything. They were typical colors of light, white light. They were not super bright, but in a dark room they clearly emitted their own independent light source. They were the size of a golf ball, they didn't give off static energy, and they did give off a sense of self-awareness. It was like watching them was almost like watching living beings. I asked what they were doing, and they were wandering around like when two people go somewhere new. At times, they moved along with each other, and then one would wander off a little ways, and then come back by the other one. That is how she told me. It's like when we go to the store, you know, we walked together having a conversation, and then one of us walks off to look at something. While writing this, that same friend called with her daughter close by, so I asked for clarification on some things that I mentioned earlier. My friend told her daughter not to look at the orbs after she asked what they were, but she didn't listen and kept looking at them anyway. 
She said they were the size of her squishy light-up ball toys, so more the size of a golf ball except slightly bigger. I know exactly what she meant. My friend didn't see them disappear because she forced herself not to look at them. Her daughter saw them disappear. She described it as a, a click or a blip and goodbye. I asked if they floated away in a particular direction, and she said no, they just went away. So, they disappeared like shutting off a light. They confirmed that it gave off a weird energy, a feeling, not like static electricity. The feeling lingered even after they disappeared from sight. I did a full investigation of the room even though they said they were free-floating and independent, still checking for light sources, reflections, all of that, but nothing. I asked if it was possible that it was something like a laser or a light from outside, but no. The windows were closed, shades were down with heavy blackout curtains in front. These curtains will even block out bright sunlight. Even with that, my friend said that her first reaction was to hit or shake the curtain behind her to check to see if there was a light leak that was the source of the orbs. It didn't affect the movement or light emission or the orbs at all. To preempt some questions, no, there's never been any paranormal activity or ghosts or otherwise witnessed by them in the almost ten years they've lived there. No, they don't believe or think about the paranormal. They totally don't believe in aliens. I can rule out ball lightning because there wasn't any static electricity in the air. And my friend is really sensitive to electrical fields, but she didn't feel anything like that. No, they weren't insects because they were translucent and had a well-defined shape, not fuzzy or blurry, and they made no sounds. I will answer any serious questions about this. I'll ask them an update if necessary and reply directly. I personally never believed in orbs, because they almost are never seen with the naked eye. They only appear on videos or in still photographs, and can typically be dismissed as light reflections off of dust. The only people that I have heard that claimed they saw them with their actual eyes were on ghost hunting shows, and they've been proven untrustworthy or ignorantly biased. But my friend that I have known for, like, more than 30 years, we are so close that she named her daughter after me, and I have a common traditional male name. Yeah, we're close, and she's a non-believer in everything paranormal. It holds a level of credibility that I can't refute, and she had a witness sharing the event. When it all adds up, I can't say it didn't happen. What happened I can only speculate and classify as a glitch. And I do have a wild speculation. What if I caused the orbs? That flash of light was so intense that came from behind me. What if it came from me? If we're in a simulation, wouldn't people like me who repeatedly have big glitches call attention to our existence? What then? Cosmic tech support? A reset or a reprogramming? What if we aren't in a simulation? Do people like me act like magnets or portals? There's no other way of saying this next part without sounding like I have a god complex or the Truman Syndrome. And yes, there actually is a disorder based off the Truman Show, look it up. But throughout history, there are stories of people with halos. I'm not saying I'm an angel because I don't believe in them, but what if they are based on people who are more like me than I understand? That light that came from the back of my head only seemed to have come from the back of my head. Maybe somewhere in my pot of goo, I have a data leak from the port in the back of my head. I laugh at this concept. Okay, 
I need a little break from this. As I said, the halo angel part, I saw something at the corner of my eye run behind me. And that was twice in five minutes. And I'm at work alone because it's the holiday and everyone is off except me. I know this sounds paranoid, but I think I'm no longer anonymous. Sorry, I need to distract from this for a while. So, uh, how about that Spider-Man movie, huh? This happened back in the late 70s, long before The Matrix was conceived of, or the Wachowski brothers had hit puberty even, so my friends and I just chalked it up as weird. To set the scene, disco was at its height, and my friends and I were just of legal age to go nightclubbing and drinking, not that we'd not done it illegally before then. <laughs> and Saturday nights consisted generally of a group of us meeting up at our local neighborhood pub in the suburbs, and then heading to the city center to whichever nightclub got the majority vote that night. Me being a bit older than my mates, I was the only one at the time that had a driving license, so it usually fell to me to be the transport for the group. Okay? My car wasn't the latest thing, about 12 years old at the time, but it got us where we wanted to go, for the most part. On the night that this event happened, there was myself and my two longtime best friends, plus the girlfriend of one of them. We decided to go to an out-of-the-way club that was situated in the back streets of the business section of the city center. Law offices, insurance companies, banking, etc. So, on a Saturday night, the streets were relatively clear, making for easy on-street parking. The few other cars parked around probably belonged to other late-night clubbers like ourselves. This section of town is laid out like this. Long, downhill, sloping main streets that are paralleled to each other, with shorter side streets linking them, block by block, down the entirety of their lengths. It was typical of that part of the old center, Birmingham, UK, and the mostly Victorian-era multi-story buildings. So, we all arrive, and I park the car in a space about halfway down the side street, which was literally around the corner from that evening's chosen club. Great, not too far to walk. We all agreed. And because of that, we all left our coats and that girlfriend's overnight bag on the back seat. Being a car from the 60s, there was no such thing as central locking, and car alarms were custom specialty items back then, so I had to go around locking three of the four doors from the inside, and then my driver's side door with the key, and then checking all the handles outside. Car crime wasn't really bad in those days, but it still happened, so I always had a mind for security. Plus, I was carrying my work toolbox and power tools in the boot, so that was firmly locked as well. That done... We all walked around the corner, left and up the slight gradient past two or three office frontages, and left again into the front door of the club. After a great night with me disco dancing most of the night with any girl that was keen, or even on my own, hey, it was the 70s, the club was beginning to turn out. Slow dance tracks from the DJ heralded the end of the fun, and we all gathered to leave. As usual for those days, having spent the night frantically dancing, I had sweated out the little alcohol I had consumed, and was easily safe to chauffeur my pals home. We left via the main, and only, door, and, as a group, turning right and down the slope to the next corner to where we knew we had left the car. 
my heart sank when I turned that corner, though. The street was completely empty. Oh, crap, and other choice words. We all said mostly the same thing at the same time. The car's been stolen. It had been right there, at the curb, facing the corner that we had just come around. There was a lot of what do we do nows, and me worrying that not only my car, but all of my tools were gone. What made it worse? Being the young bucks that we were, we'd blown through most of our meager funds during the night out, and probably couldn't even scrounge up the bus fare home between us. First things first, after much head-scratching, we all agreed that it was best to report the theft as quickly as possible. It was the days before mass communication, but there might be an outside chance that the car could be spotted by a patrol car. Panda cars, they were all called back then, and not many of them compared to today. While it was still being driven, and this meant a hike to the nearest police station. Remember, no mobile phones back then, which was on the other side of the city center. Quicker and easier than finding a call box or payphone in this part of town, and at that time of night. So, we all set off dejectedly in that direction, which meant continuing along the short side street that we were on, to the next parallel main street, and up that long hill to the major road that joined all the main streets together at their top ends. Then, it would be a diagonal cut across the city center proper to the police station by the law courts. There was little conversations, but mostly it consisted of, are you sure you locked it? Yes, I'm bloody sure I locked it, I'm not stupid. Etc. And then wishing the worst curses on whoever had ruined our Saturday night. We had made our way on to and part way up the next main block, passing another side street to our left. Then, during that next block, we decided to zigzag up the streets to make our route a little shorter and roughly diagonal in the direction that we needed to go. By this time, the chill 2am air had sobered up even my two friends and the girlfriend, and we were just stomping along to get the thing over with as quickly as possible. As we simultaneously rounded the left corner to the next short side street, we came to a dead stop. There was my car, parked neatly at the curb, in a parking meter space and not looking at all abandoned or trashed, as if by joyriders. I know what that looks like, having been the victim to a subsequent car theft. It was all as we'd left it, fully locked, and with all of our belongings as they had been. Nothing had been rifled through, and thankfully all of my tools were still in the boot. Not so much as a hair had been touched, it appeared. We all looked at each other, double-taking and glancing back all along our route, in kind of a what-the sort of way. But it didn't take us long to rally ourselves, put on our warm coats, and get underway merely thankful that we didn't have to continue the grim march to the police station. We talked about it for about the next hour or so, and all the way home as I made the rounds to their individual houses, but we could not come up with a logical explanation. A 60s car was fairly sparse in terms of ignition security, but it still would have been a fairly skilled task to hotwire it, and it would have left some evidence of tampering, which was not the case. Likewise, the doors, and not as difficult as today's cars to be sure, but still requiring some small skill or keys to overcome the locks. And then, why would someone steal the car only to abandon it after a couple of blocks? Or leave the valuables untouched? We all knew where we had originally left it, there was no dispute about that, nor individual false memories forced on the others. We all headed towards that side street as we'd come out of the club, after all. We couldn't all have been that mistaken. And I have always known where I last left my wheels. 
I couldn't afford to be without them for my job. Bear in mind, we found the car one main street and two side streets away, uphill. So it didn't roll there by itself, nor could it be merely pushed there. I always left the stick shift in gear in case the handbrake failed, a sensible precaution on old cars, which made it nigh on impossible to budge, as well as the fact that it would have needed to have been steered around the corners, necessitating access to the inside. Added to that, the car was facing in the opposite direction from how we had left it when going around the corner to the club. If a thief had taken it, they were a very neat and tidy person, leaving it exactly in a meter parking space, much as I would have done had it been me that put it there. Well, we never did report the incident to the police, and although we discussed it a few times in the following years, we never came up with a satisfactory explanation, other than the OCD thief theory. But I guess that now I've found out about glitches in the Matrix, I can finally file this one away as solved. We all stepped out of that nightclub into a slightly different version of the Matrix. Simple as that. First of all, let me be very clear. I am very, very mentally ill. It's nothing that normally causes hallucinations or delusions, though. I mean, my depression does tell me that life is meaningless, and my PTSD does tell me that nowhere and nothing is safe, but those aren't really delusions per se. Just things that are probably objectively true but are usually ignored by healthier minds so that they may continue to function and presumably propagate our species in accordance with the prime directive of all organic life. But yeah, it's a bundle of affective and anxiety disorders. Very fun. To be fair, the above is a moot point since I'm more the subject of this story than the object. I just always wanted to do my own version of First of all, I'm not mentally ill, intro except in reverse. Okay, on to the story. It's pretty simple, really. What it says in the title, due to the nature of what bilocation is, or is thought to be, I obviously couldn't experience it directly, and am relying on testimony from a friend of mine. If I'm in two places at once, the me who is me could only obviously experience one version of that span of time. I was roughly 17 years old at the time, a junior in high school. It was second semester, so springtime. I believe it was a Wednesday, but I suppose that doesn't really matter much. What does matter is that our history teacher wanted the entire class to come in after school to watch the Les Miserables movie. I believe the 1998 version with Liam Neeson for extra credit. We were doing the unit on the French Revolution, and as I remember, it was not mandatory, but highly, almost desperately encouraged for some reason that I couldn't discern either then or now. Maybe she was dealing with some personal stuff and didn't want to be alone. She was quite young, but very curmudgeonly and not particularly well-liked or pleasant to her students. So, it's a bit odd that she was so keen to spend an extra couple of hours with them. There would, of course, be a worksheet or quiz after the movie that would need to be turned in the next day to get the extra credit. I was in my school's IB program, which was basically just a college prep program where you take a bunch of AP-level classes all at once, so most of my classmates were the driven and motivated sorts. The majority of them couldn't resist the offer of extra credit, as even the slightest advantage was an advantage nonetheless. I probably started out that way, but at this point my depression and PTSD started to manifest in full force, 
probably spurred on by the puberty chemicals, and while I continued to get good grades going forward, I only did so due to a talent for osmosis and a decent memory. The motivation had already begun to leak out of me like air escaping a punctured inflatable raft, so I very briefly entertained the idea of going to the movie showing, but ultimately concluded that I could coast my way to an A without it, and I really didn't want to have any more time in that particular class. What I did decide to do was tell my parents I was staying after school for an activity, and take the couple extra hours to myself. As a kid that age, especially one whose parents had been overprotective in childhood, and who have always had to share space with a sibling, I relished the opportunity to actually be alone for a while. So, I took a walk. I walked around the school, passed and through the athletic fields, which were mostly empty that day, and down into a wooded area past the school grounds, which was essentially a public park with a nice path for walking and jogging. I was depressed, in the clinical sense, but I was also a dramatic teen, so I spent that time pining after somebody that I had an unrequited crush on, and wondering what combination of words I could put together into a bit of perfectly maudlin poetry, such that they would finally fall in love with me. Eventually, I looped back around and then got a ride home slightly before the Lemise crowd was due to disperse. The very next day, a close friend of mine at the time asked me to help him with the worksheet for the movie. I reminded him that I hadn't seen it. I didn't go to the extra credit thing. He seemed really confused and claimed that I was messing with him. I explained that I was absolutely not. I had never seen that version of Lem is to this day, and I certainly wasn't there to see it that afternoon. He then went on to tell me, with amusement and confusion in his voice and face, that not only had I been there, but I had sat behind him, that we'd had an entire conversation on and off, whispering, I assume, and that I had shared a spare juice box with him, which he apparently drank right then and there. The thing about the IB program in my school was that it was quite small and relatively new at the time. There were maybe 40-ish of us, and we all took the same classes. We all knew each other, so it couldn't just be someone who looked a lot like me and acted and spoke like me that my friend had simply never had a shared class with before that day. He wouldn't mistake anybody else in the program for any other person in the program. And here the obligatory no drugs thing comes in. We were clean, nerdy kids, and at that point most of us hadn't even had a sip of beer. And my friend is much more mentally healthy than I am. No diagnoses to this day as far as I know. Ultimately, we both sort of waved the incident away. It was, after all impossible, and if it was impossible, then it must not have been true. I know where I was and what I was doing, and he claimed with a straight face that he thought I was sitting behind him and giving him juice, but he must have been mistaken. Assuming that something weird did happen, both of us must have just figured the other was goofing and left it at that. He must have been pulling my leg. To be honest, the latter is my primary hypothesis to this day. Occam's razor would indicate that this is the case. The somewhat weird thing, that in no way rules out the rational explanation, but certainly muddies the water a bit, at least subjectively, is that we remained friends and fairly close for years and years thereafter, through college and well into adulthood, finally drifting apart only once he got married and started exclusively hanging out with other couples doing whatever it is that groups of couples do. I remain single, not surprisingly, and he has never flinched or changed his story. Across the years, every once in a while, one of us would bring up that instance, presumably to get the other to confess to it, and each time we would hold fast to our respective stories. With straight faces and then sort of just drop it again. If 
I were to investigate the occurrence now, I suppose I would try to get other people to confirm or deny what he saw, but I'm 35 now. Everyone else is also 35-ish now, depending on birthday. So, even if I were to track down one or more people from our program, their testimony would be unreliable either way. According to my friend, we mostly interacted with each other in his version of events, so... I doubt anyone else would have been paying attention to whether I was or wasn't there that day, especially in a dark room with a movie playing. I'm not really sure why it didn't occur to us to check with the others at the time. I know some theorize that the glitch in the Matrix stories have some sort of perception filter affecting them, discouraging people from sharing, but I don't really buy into that idea. Considering how popular these kinds of stories are these days, heck, they were kind of popular, though much less prominent even back then. I guess maybe we just didn't think it was worth investigating, since both of us still suspect that the other is pulling an elaborate, soon-to-be-decades-long prank, and ultimately the actual event was utterly inconsequential when it comes to our day-to-day -day lives. I'm certainly no stranger to weird bits and bobs, but... For some reason, this one sticks out most in that it continues to instill doubt. Maybe if he really did mess with me that afternoon and decided to stick by his story for fun, that little bit of doubt and wonder was his gift to me. Alright, I think I'm done. Back in 2018... I had what I can only describe as a quantum immortality experience. A really huge one. I'll save that for another post, but there have been huge glitches or differences within the world after. For me, an open skeptic. Okay, not open skeptic. I couldn't and did not want to believe in the concepts like quantum immortality, glitches, or the Mandela effect. They seemed like a modern-day religion developing based on people who lack understanding of certain fields, and suddenly having too much information because of the internet, and then having social media say that you're not alone with that one topic, which turns into a conspiracy about aliens, demon robots taking you to Mars at night, but in fact it's just sleep paralysis. The deep implications of quantum immortality was something I wanted to believe. Because that means that I died, left my loved one alone, and these people around me are not the people I loved and cherished. They were cosmic doppelgangers. So, a short list of changes. My father and best friend's childhood totally changed. Again, I'll leave the details of that also to a different post. Several actors and media B-listers died before, but now are alive and well. So many things, but it's one thing to hear Tom Baker from Doctor Who suddenly no longer dead after seeing an entire BBC program about him and seeing so many YouTubers of said TV show he was in talk about it. It's another thing completely when it's someone you know in person. I was a warehouse supervisor. We're always shipping, receiving. There's a regular truck driver who comes almost every day for years. A few I have known for almost 20 years. Other drivers are seasonal and we see them for months out of each year until the busy season ends and then we don't see them again until the following year. Well, Let's call him Harry. It's not his real name, of course, nor will I say his company's real name. I'll say it's one of the top three delivery businesses in the world. Well, Harry was a charter. I mean, this guy didn't blend into a crowd. Tall, skinny, in his late 50s, early 60s, had dark, thick hair, little to no gray. Hairstyle was even, thick glasses that looked straight out of the 1950s. His glasses had clip-on shades, and he always carried a toothpick in his hand or mouth. He had a, a booming voice, 
loud and a little raspy, yet he rarely talked unless he really had something to say or was around people like us that he was comfortable with. So, my point, there was nothing average about this guy. Well, his wife was ill and we didn't see him one season. We asked where Harry was, and his wife had sadly passed away. He took time off and we saw him the following season, we all were happy to see him. He had no issue telling us about what had happened. I'll leave the personal stuff personal, but he said he wanted to retire but couldn't because he was left with huge bills after his wife's passing. Two more years passed, and then he was a no-show again one season. I asked about him, and I was told he also became very ill with the thing that his wife had. It made sense now why he always had that damned toothpick whenever he and his wife were heavy smokers. He gave up smoking when his wife first started to get sick, and before she became really sick. Well, two more years pass and he still never returned, so I asked again. I found out he died as a result of his illness. He refused the same treatment his wife was receiving, because of how bad it was for her, even with him taking care of her. He, at that point, didn't have anyone, so he decided to ride it out. After I found out this news, I told my entire company, because we all liked this guy, and I was wondering about what had happened to him. Several coworkers didn't believe me, so over the following days, they asked his other people who worked for his same company and even his dispatcher that happens to have called for another reason, and they all confirmed it. Well, now the glitch that made chills run down my spine and really shattered my view of reality. 2018, I'm at work during the busy season. I hear a truck back into the dock. They say the company I shall not mention. I continue what I'm doing and yell, Okay, make him wait, I'll be right there. Then, I heard a voice I recognized. It took me a second honestly to process what and who I thought I heard talking across the warehouse. I stop dead in my tracks. No pun intended. I slowly walk to the dock. I thought to myself, please don't be him. Oh, please do not be him. Because in all my denial and refusal to believe in quantum immortality and glitches at that time... If I turned and saw him alive, it would mean one of three things. One, I really did die, and this is not my universe. And my goddaughter that I love more than life itself, I was there when she was born, I was there when she spoke her first words, I heard her first laugh, I saw her first steps. That special person is now in a world without me. A world where they came home one day before Easter, only to find me dead in her playroom with holiday decorations in hand. That version of me died, trying to surprise her with cheer. Second, if he was there, glitches are 100% real, and we are likely not. Meaning that my loved ones in life can just be deleted, rewritten. We have zero control. We're essentially puppets on a stage for some higher being to play with, and I hate this concept as well. Third, if he was there, I cannot trust or depend on any memory and past event as being solid or real. The past is just as changeable as the future. I also hate this because who's in charge of it? Will they just delete me? Because I remember the changes and see the glitches? Will I wake up one day to listen to my YouTube narration channels, only to find there is no record of anything ever called glitches in the Matrix, quantum immortality, or the Mandela effect? Perhaps those crazy homeless people ranting in the streets about things that don't exist aren't crazy after all. Maybe there are people who are unable to get updated with the rest of the world. So, I turn the corner, facing the dock, and I see Harry alive and well. It's 100% him, no doubt. No one else is looking shocked to see him. 
So I slowly walk up to him and say, Hey, long time no see. He responds with a grin and says, Yeah, it's been a short while. I actually feel my hands shaking. So how you been? I asked. Oh, fine, just fine. You know, same old crap, different day, he replies. So I stutter and say, I thought something may have happened with you, like you retired or moved or something. No? He replied, just doing the same old crap over and over, you know how it is, don't you? Glaring at me through his clip-on shades, he continued saying, People like us just keep going until we can't no more, but after a nap we'll wake up and do it all again. <laughs> I said it feels that way, doesn't it? I wanted to just ask or just say that I thought you were dead. People told us that you died. But I was too disturbed to, and I didn't want to bring up death because of what had happened with his wife. After he was given his freight, I said goodbye and that it was nice to see him alive and in person. As soon as he drove off, I said to everyone around, Holy crap, that was freaking hairy. My coworkers looked at me like I had two heads and said, So what? I said, He's supposed to be dead. Remember a few years back we all found out and were talking about him? But nope, none of them remembered any of it. This was not a false memory. I wasn't mistaking him for another person and I even hoped it was a practical joke of some kind that Harry's co-worker played on him to be cruel. Something like that would not go unpunished at a company like his if it was found out. But if that was the case, my co-workers would all remember it. And they don't. I will say this, I'm still employed at the same place, around the same co-workers, and I haven't seen Harry again since. I don't want to know honestly where I am anymore in the multiverse because since I've had several possible shifts, one very recently after a close call that I can't explain how I didn't get a scratch. The only differences I noticed are minor, so I can just push them into the misremembering file to keep sane. My goddaughter is still my little buddy, even more so now, because I've adapted a new outlook on life. We're all connected to our other selves in the multiverse, if that's the case. If this is a simulation, we're copies of the same code. I am who I am, my loved ones are who they are, and my love for them will not change no matter where I am. I love you, little buddy, no matter where you are, and I love every version of you that may exist, even if there is an evil version of you with a goatee somewhere. Just on an end note, I held off posting this because I get a weird feeling like I'm being watched, like something is different about this one. My coworkers are acting oddly. It's creeping me out that I just caught a coworker behind me. He snuck up behind me or just randomly appeared. I think he took a picture of the computer screen and what I was typing. Why would he do that at this time? when I'm also typing on here every day without him ever caring. I'm a bit afraid this time. I do hope this gets posted and I feel like something is different with this one. This was just part of a bigger quantum immortality event. I've had so many glitches directly because of this. Glitches as in noticeable differences between the world before and the world after. I'll be happy to do a longer list and answer any questions as best I can, and I'll post a link when it's finished. My boyfriend, Dan, and I genuinely used to love taking long, almost impromptu road trips to places that we've never been. Typically, in the spring and fall, around our birthday months, mine's in April, his is October, we would randomly decide on where to go, load up the car, and just head out onto the road. Of course, he would have to schedule the time off, 
and I would have to make sure my clients knew that I would be out for a few days. So, they weren't 100% impromptu. There was always some planning and scheduling, but we would pretty much randomly choose our destination the week of the trips. He and I have been together for close to 10 years now, and we did this every year from the fifth year we were together all the way to 2019. When we had the money and the time, we would just go. On the particular trip back in early 2019 that this whole glitch happened, we had actually planned to take a long drive from our home in Madison Heights, Michigan, all the way out to a place called Bryce Canyon National Park in southern Utah. This trip was a particularly long one. It was about a 28-hour drive, so we had planned on taking a little more than a week off, and we were going to stop around the halfway mark, somewhere between the southwestern tip of Nebraska and the top corner of Colorado. If you've never driven that little section of this country, there really isn't much there between North Platte and Sterling. But it's still beautiful, at least to me. I remember this whole plan because... I recall how much we had actually planned out on this specific trip. It was a bit out of character for us to do so much plotting along the way, but we felt it was necessary due to the length of the drive. And while some people may say that we could have just gone straight through if one of us slept and the other one drove, the problem with that is that I actually don't have a license due to a medical issue that I'm not going to get into here. But he obviously knew this and he was totally fine with driving and stopping about midway. Plus, it gave us more time to take it all in. Which, isn't that the point of road trips anyways? Back to it. The plan, as stated, was to leave our home at 5 in the morning. We would drive all the way out to the tiny tourist town of Ogallala, Nebraska, and spend the night there. This would be about... 16 hours, and then the remainder of the trip from Ogallala to Bryce Canyon in the morning, which was only about 11 hours. Splitting it with the majority in the first half meant that we could go a bit slower on the trip throughout literally all of Colorado, if necessary, and we would still get there at a good time to check in to the hotel. We followed this plan as we had basically written it. We left home on time, got out to Ogallala, stayed there overnight, and then planned to head out in the morning. While day one was perfect, it was day two where things kind of went awry. We both woke up in a slight bit of a panic, because when we opened our eyes, we noticed it was already sunny out. Our plan was to head out around 5 in the morning and get there at 5 to 6 in the evening. But when we checked the clock, it was already 8.30. For some reason, Dan's phone didn't charge and had died overnight, which caused our main alarm to not go off. And while this isn't necessarily the glitch, we checked the charger and the outlet. He unplugged the phone and plugged it back in, and it started charging. It was definitely weird, but it's not what the story is about. Because we woke up late, we decided to go ahead and just get breakfast since our plan was already messed up. We stopped at a local diner, and we had our food and enjoyed the late morning, and then headed out onto the highway at around 10.30 or so. This meant if we drove directly, we would get to our hotel destination at 10 at the earliest. So, it wasn't too bad, but it was still way off schedule, which definitely upset Dan. I told him it was fine, and that losing a few hours was acceptable since we planned to take it slow today anyways. After a bit, we were on the road and back to a steady pace, so things were getting as close to back on track as they could. 
after about three hours on the highway, heading straight for our destination, Google Maps made a comment about there being heavy traffic ahead, or something about an accident. I can't remember, but it recommended an alternate route, and that would add about 20 minutes to our time. Again, Dan was upset, but we relented and took the route that it said that we should. Adding this extra half hour meant that we would get there at around 11 or so, and that we would be entering Utah somewhere close to 6 p.m. This is where the glitch actually happens. By this time, we had been on the road for three and a half hours, and we got on the road at 10.30 a.m. This means that it was only around 2 in the afternoon. Only a few minutes after we get back onto the route, Google Maps chimes in again and does its little, Welcome to Utah. When it said this, I chuckled and said, See, we're making good time. Which was apparently the wrong thing to say, because my boyfriend pulled the car over and just stared at the phone blankly. I asked him what was going on, because it kind of freaked me out. He just slowly looked back over at me, and then back to the phone, and then once more at me with that look of pure shock. At first, for me, it didn't click, but he quickly explained why he was so confused. There was absolutely no way for us to already be hitting Utah. It's around seven hours to get from Ogallala to the Utah border on 70 West which is the highway we had been taking. We left at 10.30 because we woke up late. We had to add half an hour because of the accident, which meant that it was going to be seven and a half hours after the time we left at the minimum, which was going to be somewhere in the realm of 6 p.m. or later. The time that it said we had entered Utah and the time on the clock was 2.18. Based on this time, we would have had to have been going at a ridiculous speed to get there, and we weren't. He was adamant that it was impossible, but he reloaded maps on his phone, made me load it up on my phone, and he checked the clock on every device that we owned. They all synced up. We were four and a half hours away from Bryce Canyon, it was 2.18 p.m. Somehow, without any logical explanation, we had managed to get ourselves pretty much back to the original schedule, despite waking up late and the delay on the road. I didn't have an explanation, but I was happy to chalk it up to some kind of miracle. He was not. He was in a weird state of panic, but after a while... We got back on the road and pressed on. We got to the hotel at around 6. We checked in, and he went straight to sleep for the night. Which was kind of a bummer, but I could tell this whole thing had messed with his head. Thankfully, it didn't affect him enough to ruin our trip or anything, but it was enough for that to be our last road trip for a while. Obviously, we've missed out on a few because of COVID, but... We didn't go anywhere at the end of 2019 or beginning of 2020, mostly because of him. As much as he won't admit it, I feel like this whole thing has actually given him a weird fear of driving long distances, which is not something he had to deal with prior. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to get him to go on a trip this year, but I'm also not holding my breath. But anyways, that's my glitch. And it's one that I still don't have an answer for to this day. I have so many glitches, I figured I would start posting them all, big or small. For the past three years, I've been renovating my master bedroom. Okay, renovating isn't accurate gutting the room down to the studs, replacing the ceiling, floor, 
windows, electric, everything. I'm still not done because I started it right before the pandemic and all the curfews and so on. I'm also doing it completely alone on a super tight budget. To top it all off, I'm a perfectionist with some things, and I'm 50 with back issues. So yeah, I bit off more than I could chew. It doesn't help that I'm lucky to get a few hours a month to work on it. Okay, so to the glitch. My sister also lives in the same house. Money is tight, so splitting the bills makes life easier. She works the night shift at a big box store. I work a day shift somewhere else. So, we only see each other in passing, so it all works out. I often need to work on the room when she's supposed to sleep. Another reason it's taking so long, but she's okay with it once a week. I will often hear her snoring in her room, which is on the south wall of my room, or hear her walking around talking to herself, or the television in the living room, which is attached to the north wall of my room. So, depending on where I hear her, I'll try to work on the opposite side of the room just to be nice. The thing that freaked me out is, as I sat to take a break in the middle of the room, I could hear her clearly snoring in her room. Okay then, how did I then at the same time clearly hear her walking around and talking to herself as she was watching TV in the living room? I thought, is someone else here? As soon as I open my room door that enters the living room, the TV and talking stops. The snoring doesn't. No, she isn't sleepwalking, she has a bad knee, and she in no way can run like the Flash. And no, no one else was there. It gets weirder, it's not an isolated incident. It happens regularly since I started the remodeling. I know, people think ghosts. This is the house that I was raised in. Me and my sister got it when my parents were tired and moved to an adult community. I never had a bad or ghost experience, not even when my father did construction on the house back in the day. But I did hear things that can be classified as paranormal. I, as a kid, regularly heard what sounded like someone in the kitchen doing kitchen stuff, like opening drawers and cooking at all hours of the night. There never was anyone there. Nothing was ever moved or out of place. My mother also admitted a few years ago that she heard it as well, thinking it was me or my sister, until she got up a few times to yell at us, only to find the kitchen empty and us sleeping. The other thing that I heard regularly was the sound of distant machinery and people talking like they were at the far end of a factory or warehouse. I heard it so many times that I can tell you the details. Like, it was always two to three male voices. They aren't intense, I can't understand what they were saying, but exactly like I'm in the back corner of a warehouse, just hearing normal ambient noise and going-ons. The machinery that I hear, it's like a conveyor belt or something like that. And no, there wasn't ever a warehouse or factory here on this land. This house was built in the early 30s, and before that it was part of a farm. Yes, there are factories close, but they are in no way close enough to hear what I was hearing. And as a kid, most of them were abandoned, and local crooks had stripped the places clean of copper and metal to try to make money on the scrap. Back to now, my room had two doors, one on the south side and one on the north. The south door I locked and never used, I even blocked it off with bookshelves for years. I only ever used the north door. Since the remodeling had started, I was temporarily using both doors for a few days. 
I always, as a kid, had nightmares about that door for some reason. When that was my parents' room in the 70s through the 90s, they used both. Nothing traumatic happened to me in that house, so I never knew what was up with that door. I figured since I'm gutting the whole room, I would get rid of that door for good. I overdid it a little and sealed it off using expensive, extra-long decking screws, pressure-treated 2x4s, industrial-strength decking adhesive. It's the strongest thing in my entire house now. I made it into bookshelves that inset in the wall that actually look good. But now, I can still hear things through it. I don't know how I forgot to mention that I also used special ridged soundproofing insulation while sealing it off. That room is almost airtight now. I went so overboard with insulating, reinforcement, and so on, it's like a freaking space station. I shouldn't be able to hear anything like what I can. But what had tipped me over into the Twilight Zone is that short time I was using both doors, every time I heard my sister in two places at the same time, where she actually ended up when I checked, depended upon which door I used. If I used the door on the same wall that her room was on, she would be in the living room and the snoring would stop instantly. If I used the door that opened into the living room, the sound of her talking to the TV would instantly stop, and she would be in her room, snoring. Now, I know some people think I imagined it, but here's the kicker. I went on FaceTime with a friend who lives in another state. He said, Is that sound your sister snoring? I said, Yeah, maybe. I put the phone by the door, and he could hear it. I said, You want to see something really weird? I walked over to the other door, put my phone up to it, and he said, wait, how is your sister watching TV and sleeping in a different room? I laughed, holding the camera facing the door to the living room where you can clearly hear the TV and my sister talking. I opened the door super fast. Poof. Silent, empty, living room. I walk outside my room around to her room and loud snoring. I then told him about the whole thing. He asked me what happens if you go back in your room and go out the other door. I paused and said I didn't know because I never tried going out one door and then running into the room and going out the other door. I closed my door and my sister apparently woke up and went into the living room to start watching TV. The snoring didn't start up the rest of that day. I thought deeply about what would happen if I tried that and my sister instantly changed places. That was what made me go so overboard with sealing off that door. Now, I really need to say that I don't believe in ghosts, but I do think that there are thin spots in our universe. I've come to the conclusion my house sits on one of them. The warehouse sounds could be an actual real place in a reality where my town was zoned differently and the abandoned warehouse a block over was built where my house is. The sound in the kitchen could actually have been one of us doing normal things one does in a kitchen, except in another universe. My house being a glitched place, it oddly makes sense to me. Perhaps that's why I experience so many glitches regularly. I was raised within a glitched place. Or maybe I am the glitch and the fact that I grew up in that house has affected it. No, I don't think that I'm Neo, but I do know there seems to be forces at play that insist on my life going in a direction that I don't want it to go, and the more I fight it, the harder it pushes back. It seems like whatever it is doesn't want me to do the remodeling and really didn't like me messing with that door. There's one other thing that I, in 50 years, can't seem to do that is totally ridiculous and defies reason. And it's odd, but I'll save that for another post, if I can even seem to post it. So, 
Someone told me about this subreddit after I posted on Paranormal, so this is a repost from about three years ago now. I recently had another small glitch about this exact post experience with my mother as well. I figured why not post it here, where it belongs. I don't post much, but I've been holding this in for a while. I wanted to see if maybe any of you had had a similar experience. To get the story started, I'll have to jump back in time. Around 2015 or 16, I was getting ready to go out with my mother and grandmother to go to Hobby Lobby. And for those of you who don't know what Hobby Lobby is, it's a store that's full of art and craft items, candles, etc. It's like a Walmart for crafts and art. Anyhow, after I was done getting ready, I sat in my room playing with my parakeet because I had some time to spare. A bit of time had passed, and my mother, whom I told to get me when she was ready to go, hadn't come to get me. I walked out into the living room and she was flabbergasted by my appearance. Not because of the way I was dressed, but because I had come out of my room. My mother claimed to have come into my room and said the lights were off, and she had checked all around for me and assumed I went to my grandma's. She lives right behind my mom's house. I told her I was in my room the entire time, and we both felt strange after that. Now, before this entire incident, my mother was very liberal, as well as a few of my other family members. A bit of time passed, and when I woke up one day, everything had changed. My grandma, who was strictly against tattoos and dyed hair, began doing so. She got a tattoo. She dyed her hair pink. I was highly confused and brushed it off as a change of heart. And that was until my mother became this kind of hardcore conservative overnight. It was all weird. And my other grandmother, who didn't like tattoos either, got one as well. Everything that I grew up with had just changed. Little by little... I've been noticing more differences in my family from what I had grown up with. I kept trying to make excuses for it, but nothing was fitting right. I'm still stuck here in this universe that doesn't feel like my own. Now, I've always been spiritual in the sense that spirits are attracted to me, and I connect with my third eye often. But I don't know what to do, and I've read theories that once you hop... You can't go back to where you're from. And this isn't like a political issue. I'm not mad that my mother is conservative or whatever. It's just totally different from the mom that I grew up with. Things have gotten weird. Some of my lifelong wishes have come true, but nothing feels right. Ever since I've realized all this, my brain has gotten strange. I suffer from bouts of disassociation, which at first I thought could have been seizures, except my soul feels like it's floating above my body. Nothing feels like it belongs to me anymore. My body feels foreign, often. It feels as though my soul is trying to connect with a body that never belonged to it. I know, I sound kind of crazy, but... I'm saying this with 100% honesty from my side. I was going to try to make a video, but I don't want to upset my family or scare them by making them think I don't care about them. I try to make this new life work for me, but nothing is helping. Does anyone know what I can do to adjust? I have memories that nobody in my family remembers. And I tried going to doctors who say I should get a brain scan and tests, but I can't afford that right now. They say I'm coherent enough to pass the tests, but I don't know why I'm having these episodes of disassociation slash minor brain seizures. I really highly believe that this isn't my world. Those close to me can vouch for me, and 
I can get screenshots of old text I've sent stating what I'm stating here. If anyone has any sort of idea what this is, please, I'm willing to hear it all. All I know is that doctors are puzzled, I'm puzzled, and nobody besides my boyfriend and closest friends know about this. If you've read this, thanks. This was a small venting session about my situation, and I hope that someone might have some answers. Edited, 1204-2021. Someone asked me if any major events happened in 2016, and I forgot to mention it. The same year that I experienced an overdose, I was 16 or 17 at the time, I experienced the void. A pure, true, black nothingness. I can't recall if it happened before or after the room incident stated above, so I can't say what is truly the cause for this glitch. I originally posted this three years ago, and have undergone extreme life changes. Changes that never seemed reasonable or even possible, for that matter. I'm 22 now, and still to this day, believe I'm not in my world anymore. My life has 180'd starting in 2016. People I'm close to have forgotten past major events or conversations between us. I'm living the life of another version of me. I don't belong here, and honestly, I'm just living day by day. The only reason I'm back here updating this is because of the situation I encountered two days ago, which I have proof of. This recollection was told on a channel that I had been telling my closest friends that I wanted proof that glitches exist before I heard my story being told to me through my headphones. I messaged my mom immediately and told her I wrote about our portal encounter and just heard it on YouTube for the very first time. She messaged me back, just moments later, freaking out that she was watching a paranormal show and the very second I messaged her, they were talking about portals. I have these screenshots and I'm so glad to know that I now have just a smidgen of evidence and that I'm not crazy. In the summer of 2017, around two hours after my grandfather passed away, me and my sister were in a horrific car accident. It was a bit past midnight. We were on our way to my grandpa's house. I was behind the wheel and driving moderately fast. I was supposed to make a U-turn, but the brakes failed, and we hit the guardrail. The front of the car was demolished and both of us were badly injured. I believe that I lost consciousness for a few seconds, and when I woke up again, I looked at her and saw blood all over her face, and realized that she too had lost consciousness. She was slowly coming too, when I squeezed myself out the window and went to the other side to get her out of the car. Her door was stuck just like mine, so I couldn't get her out. People started to gather around and called 911. The firefighters came and removed the door and finally got her out of the car. When the ambulance was taking us to the hospital, I was having the longest deja vu of my entire life. I knew which hospital we were going to, even though nobody had told me. I knew how the interior of the hospital looked, somewhere I've never been before, and I knew the name of the doctor who was supposed to stitch me up, and that was someone that I had never met before. It's weird because as soon as me and my sister were alone and could talk to each other, she told me about how she feels like she's been there before and was feeling deja vu the entire time. It might seem normal for people who suffered head trauma to experience these kind of things and read too much into something that isn't actually there, but it's a lot more weird than it seems like at first glance. 
I believe that both of us died on that timeline. But for some reason, our consciousness switched into a parallel version of ourselves in another universe. And the constant feeling of deja vu was because of our consciousness settling into the bodies of our alternate selves with the original consciousness still present. Which then caused the feeling of experiencing everything twice. Now, here's something truly bizarre. There was this song called Zalem by Mosen Chavoshi, which our mom loved and listened to almost every day. Even when my mom didn't play it, my older brother would. It was kind of a signature song in our home back in 2005 to 2007 or 08. So, a few months after the crash, I was having a conversation with one of my co-eds about music, and she was without a doubt the number one fan of Mosen Chavoshi, to the point that we used to call her Chavoshist. She was talking about her favorite Chavoshi song, and I just remembered all those years of listening to Zalem. I said, yeah, he's a good singer. My mom loved Zalem. She used to play it on repeat until someone became sick of hearing it. She frowned and asked me about the song that I mentioned. She said that he doesn't have a song named Zalem. I thought maybe I got the name wrong, so I sang the chorus... And she shook her head and said that that's not a Chavoshi song. She named Farouk as the singer. I swore that the song I used to listen to was Chavoshi's. His voice is unmistakable, and there's no way that I would get that wrong. So, she asked me to send her the song. Obviously, I didn't have our old computer in which the song was stored, and I couldn't find our old Chavoshi mix CD. So, I googled it, and no matter how much I looked, I could not find it online. I even searched by the lyrics and only found the song Zalem by Farouk. I thought, well, maybe it's the same song and I was wrong all along, so I downloaded it and I listened to it. But the song by Farouk could not be more different from what I remember. Sure, it has the same lyrics, but the melody and genre of it is completely different. So, I asked my mom about it, and guess what? She's never heard of it, and neither has my brother who gave us the song in the first place. They have no recollection of that song, whether it be by Chavoshi or Farouk. On the other hand, my sister remembers it. I sang her the chorus, and she said it was Shavoshi's song. Somehow she and I have memories about a song which doesn't even exist in this world. I don't know why or even how it's possible, but I sincerely believe that we moved through the dimensions when we were both unconscious after the crash. I've heard stories that happened to other people which are similar to our experience. I don't want to get in too much on this one, but I think it has something to do with my grandpa's death. Maybe we were supposed to die that night, but his death caused an event which led us to move on to another universe, where we did not die. This happened in 2012. I want to give all the context, so I apologize that it's long. It was the summer after my freshman year of college, and I was at my parents' house. It's a ranch-style house on a hill, where you enter into the second floor through the front door, and there's a staircase that goes downstairs, where you can exit to the woods outside the back of the house. My parents were away for work, they worked together, and I was planning to pull an all-nighter to meet a writing deadline for my internship. It was Saturday, and my younger brother, 17 at the time, was planning to go to some big party that night with a handful of his friends, 
including one of our childhood friends from the Netherlands, who was staying with us for the summer. My best friend and I agreed to drop him and his friends off, and pick them up. I'll skip ahead to when we picked them up from the party. There were five of them total, the four we dropped off plus another one tagging along who I didn't know, and they were so drunk. I never heard the new kids say a word. We brought them back and they crashed in various parts of the house pretty much immediately. My best friend and I took the California King in the master bedroom downstairs, where I would pull my all-nighter writing once she fell asleep. One of the friends crashed in the living room behind our bedroom. You had to go through our bedroom to get to it. Everyone else was upstairs. My brother was in his room, directly above the sitting room. His other friend was in the guest room, directly above the master and our Netherlands friend plus the new kid actually fell asleep sitting up leaning on each other on the couch in the living room upstairs, across an open floor plan from the front door slash dining room area. So, it's 3am and everyone except me is asleep. I had just come back downstairs after putting on a pot of coffee and had seen the two boys on the couch in the same position they had been in all night. I go into the bathroom at the foot of the stairs and don't bother locking the door. Just as I sit down to go, I suddenly hear voices having a conversation upstairs, right near the top of the steps, which is also close to the front door, and it's clearly a man and a woman. So... I assume something went wrong on the trip and my parents have come home unexpectedly. They weren't due back for another couple days. Fearing they would immediately come downstairs to their room, I run over and lock the bathroom door, then finish peeing, wash my hands, etc. And all the while, I can hear this animated conversation upstairs. But... I can't make out what they're saying, even though it's getting louder and louder. I finish up quickly in the bathroom because I need to go greet my parents and explain why we're in their bed and all these kids, who are surely awake and confused now, at least the ones in the living room, are in the house. So, I'm running up the stairs, and the conversation is getting noticeably louder and louder, the closer that I get. As I'm a couple steps away from the top landing, they're fully yelling, and the moment my foot hits the top steps, silence. I look at the front door and scan the whole dining room and living room area for my parents. No one is there. Everything is exactly the same as it was a few minutes ago when I was upstairs including the two boys sitting exactly as they were before, fast asleep. I start shaking and my heart starts pounding, keeping my back to the stairs. I back into the kitchen all the way up to the coffee pot, too scared to turn my back on the area the voices were coming from. With shaking hands, I pour another cup of coffee, and I stand there in shock desperately trying to rationalize what just happened. At this moment, the friend who was in the guest room comes into the kitchen, barely awake, still drunk, and looking for water. I ask him, Did you hear any of that? And he had no idea what I was talking about. I gave him water and he went back to bed. I told myself the new kid that I never heard speak, it must have a voice like a woman, and him and our friend must have woken up, had the conversation, and somehow fallen back asleep right when I got upstairs. It didn't make any sense, but I was so terrified that I forced myself to accept it, at least until daylight. I went back downstairs, eventually got back to work, and once I finished... I waited until the sun came up to try to get some sleep. A few hours later, 
everyone was up, and I eagerly said good morning to the new kid to hear his voice. It turned out to be far deeper than anyone else in the house, and a sharp chill then ran down my spine. I asked him and our friend if they woke up and had a heated conversation in the middle of the night, but I already knew the answer. No. In fact, as soon as one woke up and realized they were sleeping on each other, he moved to a different chair. As everyone gathered in the living room, I told them what happened and no one knew what to say or had any idea how to explain it. This experience forced me to allow the existence of the paranormal, ghosts, or whatever, because it's been almost 10 years, and I still have no explanation. The property borders a wooded wildlife preserve that was originally the home of the Minkwa tribe, along with the whole neighborhood and more land beyond that. I'm not sure where this tribe lives today, and I don't believe this is even the name that they called themselves. I don't know why this thought kept entering my head as I tried to figure out what happened. Maybe because I couldn't make out the conversation? The house itself was only 60 years old or so, and to my knowledge, no one died there. Though the woman who lived there before us swore that it was haunted. So, any ideas? I'm reposting this story because it's been over four years since I last shared it. I've been binging this sub recently and thought I would take a shot at getting some more opinions. Sorry for the length, but I wanted to be as detailed as possible. Bear with me because I feel like it's worth it. Hopefully. Okay. So this happened to me about six years ago. Two years at the time of writing this. It really freaked me out at the time, and I couldn't wrap my head around it, and I still can't, but after finding the sub, I figured I would share it with y'all and see if you can shed some light. I want to preface the story that this happened right around New Year's, a couple of years back. At the time, a large group of some old friends had taken a road trip together from the East Coast, to visit myself and some other friends here in Colorado. There were about 14 of them that all caravanned out to stay for a week and to celebrate New Year's in Denver. A couple of days in, everyone decided to all go get food and drinks from this place in Denver, so I took the 40-minute drive from where I live to meet up with them. I drove up to the restaurant and parked my car outside on the side of the street. Everyone was already inside. I turned my car off and got out only to realize I didn't have my wallet. I unlocked and opened the car back up and grabbed my wallet off of the passenger seat. Then I closed the driver's door once again. This is where things get weird. This time, when I reached for my keys to relock the car, it wasn't in my pocket where I could have sworn I had just placed it. I started to check around my other pockets, but it was nowhere to be found. I checked the driver's seat, passenger's seat, and even the back seat, but nothing. Then I thought to myself, what if it fell on the ground when I got out of the car? Maybe it was on my lap. I look on the ground to find a big, dirty, slushy puddle of water from snowmelt that my car is parked in. At this point, I decide to get an empty 24-ounce coffee cup out of the back seat and start sifting through the water to try to see if it fell in. After about 20 to 30 minutes of sifting through this disgusting water, I give up and go inside to meet my pals. By this time, I'm like 45 minutes late to meet them because I've spent the whole time outside looking for my key. I tell them about the situation, and we all agree that it's definitely somewhere in my car, and to not worry about it too much. We all get food for about another 45 minutes, and then we decide to split. 
we leave, and about ten of them, that's not an exaggeration here, came outside to my car to help me look inside and around my car. We all searched high and low, tearing my car apart, looking for that key, but still nothing. After a good 30 minutes, we called it off and someone gave me a lift back to my house. I had to call a tow truck to bring my car home because that was my only key. The next day, I had a locksmith come to my house and make me two new keys, just plain metal, non-electric ones with no fob. I used one and kept the other in my house. Fast forward about two months down the line, my friend and I are at my house and decide to go somewhere. I can't remember where, and we hop in my car. He jumps in the passenger seat, and I in the driver's. While I'm getting my things in order, I see him reach under his butt and proceed to pull something out from under him that he's sitting on. Lo and behold, he pulls out the electronic key that disappeared two months earlier, just right off the passenger seat. It's important to note that this is not a friend who I had been with at all during the time of losing the key. In fact, he wasn't even in the state that week, and I'm pretty sure he knew nothing about me losing it in the first place. For the life of me, I cannot understand how it got there. I know it wasn't there earlier that day or even that month. I would have seen it either cleaning out my car or one of my ten friends who had helped me search would have seen it sitting there. The crazy thing is, a bunch of other people have ridden in my car post-losing that key, and pre-friend sitting on it. Nobody else had ever noticed anything was there under their back end. I don't get what happened, but I know that dang key was not just sitting on that seat for two months. I'm positive of it. I was dumbfounded at the time, and I, honestly, six years later, still am. I've since reconciled the fact sometimes we experience glitches in the Matrix, and it's often best to not overthink it. Otherwise, I'll just drive myself insane. I am curious to hear what y'all's opinions are, or similar experiences have been. When I was a teenager, I would gotten Lyme disease, and it messed me all up, especially as I got older. I started getting arthritis in my early to mid-twenties, and it only got worse as I got older. When I hit my forties, I started to get cognitive dysfunctions. I constantly searched for a way to increase my quality of life, and one day I stumbled across nootropics. They range from caffeine-like effects, to enhancing memory, reflexes, and better retention of new information. I know I was skeptical as well, but after some trial and error, I found a certain few that I will not disclose. My life changed. I went from feeling like I was a 90-year-old in a 40-year-old's body, to feeling like I was 20. Not just okay only physically, but mentally as well. I got promoted, my artistic skills drastically changed. I'll see if I can post an example of my art before and after, but anyways, to the glitch. I had a blister pack in my hand with three and a half pills in it, my last until my new stuff arrived. So I was very careful with them. They're my saviors. <laughs> As I was about to take one, my phone rang. I picked up the phone with my left hand. I held the blister pack of three and a half in my right hand. I never put them down for a minute or so. Then I was on the phone. I felt them in my hand. I hung up the phone, opened my right, and it was gone. Totally gone. I felt it in my hand the entire time until I opened my hand. I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. I yelled, no, what the hell? I looked on the floor, under the bed, through the entire room. 
although I never moved from where I was. Now, I'm logical, mostly, so I did a check. I know I took it out of the case, I counted it, and it never left my hand. I had only boxers on, so I couldn't have dropped it into a pants cuff or a pocket or something like that. I tore the room apart looking in places that it could not have fallen. It was gone. Totally gone, and I was livid. I went about my day as usual, and then a friend said, Did you check your car? I asked them why. I had it in my hand in the bedroom. But, being desperate, I searched my car, and I found it in a backpack that I had not used in a while. Now, at first, I thought it wasn't the same one that had disappeared. I was just happy that I had something to hold me over until I got my new ones, but it gets super weird as I checked the pack. Three and a half were in said pack. Okay, so just a coincidence, right? And no. See, the blister pack has foil holding the individual tablets in, so the half would fall out, so with the pack, that glitched out. I reused a piece of masking tape from a sandwich order, you know, when you get a sandwich from a deli and they put the tape around it with the order number and the description. I put that over the pack because I couldn't find a roll of tape, and I just used it because I repurpose everything, kind of like a, a poor man's MacGyver. Well, the one that I found in the car had that exact same piece of tape over it. The same number was ripped, and it was placed the exact same. I basically said, Whatever, Matrix, thank you for giving it back. <laughs> now, later that night, I'm again standing in the same place where the glitch happened, and I was only in my boxers after a shower, when I then felt something hit my leg. I looked down, and the blister pack was next to my foot. I said, what the hell? It fell from the exact same spot it should have the first time if I had dropped it. It had the same three and a half in it, and that same piece of tape. I left the other one in the car, so I went and looked in the car, and it wasn't there. One part where I came out ahead is, I took one and a half when I found it during the day, so I gained one and a half back. And I know what people think, it was in my boxers possibly, but no, I changed underwear after the shower, and I would have felt the hard plastic blister pack in my pants. I don't know what to make of this. It's like the universe or Matrix self-corrected, the missing item replaced it, and then it removed the replacement when the original reappeared. If we are in a simulation, it must be a beta test because it's so dang glitchy and sloppy. Or it's just as I say, if you don't want to fall down the rabbit hole, don't follow the white rabbit. Okay, so I've been sitting on this story since the 90s when it happened. 2011, when I joined Reddit, it's kind of long, and it turns out I'm kind of lazy, but I think it's time. For background, at the time I was about 23, and I shared a home with my then-husband, who was 24, my sister, 31, and my two young kids, both boys ages 4 and 2. And this was about 1994. One thing you should know is that throughout my entire life, things have just gone missing around me. As inexplicable as those events were, it dropped something but it never made a sound and was never found, it was on my bed when I turned around and then it was gone, you know, that type of thing. I always pinned it on being klutzy, inattentive, forgetful, or even just one of those weird things. When we moved into this place, the missing stuff went into complete overdrive. 
It was making me feel insane. I was at a point in my life where I didn't want to accept it as just one of those things anymore. It just wasn't a reasonable explanation. And stuff was going missing constantly, pretty much daily. I'd make up explanations in my head, no matter how unlikely the explanation was. Okay, maybe my two-year-old got out of bed, silently came down the stairs, made it past everyone in the living room without being seen, went into the kitchen silently, made it onto the counter, grabbed my item, and then did the whole thing in reverse. And then a week later, replicated it, but this time put the item back? I mean, honestly, not likely. But what other explanation is there? So, the event in question. It was a weekday. My sister went to work, and my shift-working husband is taking the kids out of town to visit his family. I'm taking the day to get some child-free errands done. I got everyone out the door and had a coffee, read the newspaper in peace, and then started gathering my items for the errands. I put my house and car keys on the coffee table while I went to the kitchen to put my cup in the sink. Note that because I had a two-year-old, there was nothing else on the coffee table. We kept it as bare as much as possible. I come back into the living room, and the keys aren't there. Okay, this is ridiculous. I retrace my steps. Maybe I absentmindedly picked them up again. Nope, the kitchen counter is bare. Okay, with my coat that I put down, maybe? No. I'll fast forward through much of the next 45 minutes... I will say that I had the idea that maybe my losing stuff was due to a brain tumor or something. Like maybe the items really were there and for some reason I just wasn't seeing them. Which led me to sweeping my arm across the coffee table at least a dozen times and turning it on its side at least three times. I looked every place that I could think of. In kitchen cupboards, in the bathroom that I hadn't used, in the upstairs bathroom that I definitely hadn't used, in the sink, which was empty besides one cup, under the sofa, which I lifted up in the sofa, I probably lifted the heavy TV. I do remember the last place I looked was by the front door, and I emptied out every single shoe, even though it was a hefty bundle of keys. I mean, I was really running out of places to look. I finally thought, fine, you know what? I have gone insane. Maybe I never had the keys. Maybe my husband accidentally took them. Whatever, I'm not doing any errands today. I'm done. And I then dejectedly walked back into the living room, and on the middle of the otherwise bare coffee table were my keys. That was one of two incidents that I absolutely could not explain, no matter how unlikely. This was a small townhouse. Small. Limited ways in and out. No doors. You could look into one room from the other. And I was all alone. For the record, my things still disappear. But nowadays, I just shrug. I'm not playing that game, universe. Having binge listened to a large portion of the Glitch in the Matrix stories here on the As the Raven Dreams channel, I thought I would share just a smidge of my reality shifting life. The first thing I want to make clear is that glitches in the Matrix are very much a part of the phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect. I've been disappointed to hear people being rejected from Mandela Effect pages as not relevant. A change in your reality is a Mandela effect, and there are many wonderful channels online if you're interested in connecting with people just like you who have extraordinary experiences. That being said, for me, middle-aged woman from England, it began in 2015. 
for me. McDonald's changed to McDonald's, and someone pulled me up for my spelling, which I laughed at, at first. But then I began to notice that all of the McDonald's fronts changed from red to green. I mean all of them. No disruption to the service while painters up and down the country rushed to paint the fronts of all the premises. They just simply changed suddenly to green. I did mention it to people who didn't seem to notice or care, and I just went along with it. That was the beginning of years of wondering why certain logos and brand names had changed, and it wasn't until three years later that I had my next uh, encounter with reality. I was walking through my hometown with my grandson. Now, bear in mind, my hometown is very old and has buildings of historical importance. The chief judge in the regicide of Charles I lived there, and we have something called blue plaques which adorn buildings of national importance nationwide. As we were walking down the main street, I noticed a beautiful black iron plaque about 18 inches long, embedded in the ground outside of a shop which was circa 1400. The plaque outlined the long history of the shop in beautiful gilt writing. Oh, isn't that beautiful? I exclaimed, adding, The council have surpassed themselves there. We walked across the road to the 500-year-old pub where the chief regicide the king worked and served his articles. The building has a blue plaque on the wall because, of course, this is a building of national importance. As we crossed the road... I could see that, there, embedded in the pavement, was another splendid black plaque, stating the history of the building. I commented to my grandson that, it's beautiful, but that building already has the blue plaque, and it says the same thing. We walked on, discussing the town's history. A few days later, I was walking past another building which now sits beside the bypass, but had been the town's registry office. My youngest daughter had been registered there before it was shut, and the registry moved out of town. It was now a wedding boutique. I didn't know anything more about the history of the building, until I noticed the black plaque sitting outside of the building, again, embedded in the pavement, again, in beautiful gilt writing. The plaque told me that it had once been a cottage hospital, built in 1866. I admired the plaque and was happy with the new knowledge that it had given me. I don't live in my hometown, and it was a number of weeks before I was, once again, walking through my town center. I walked round the corner and stopped in my tracks. No black plaque. I rushed towards where I had clearly seen it embedded, and there was nothing there. And I mean, nothing. No mark in the pavement to indicate it had ever been there at all. Nothing. Not a silch. The two other plaques had also disappeared with no sign of their existence at all. I don't know what the bloody hell was going on. I didn't know about the Mandela effect or glitches in the Matrix at that point, and I told my husband what had happened. He thought I had just had a dream. I explained that the plaques had been there over the course of a few months, and that I read that the wedding dress shop on the bypass was the cottage hospital built in 1866. How could I know that from a dream? He thinks I had a psychic dream. He worried my daughter about it, and I visited the town hall to find out some history about the building, and sure enough, it was the cottage hospital built in 1866. There have been uncountable changes in reality. Glitches in the Matrix, Mandela effects, same thing. Why and how? Nobody knows, but some big stuff is going down and we're in it together. Share the love, beautiful people, and thank you for your time. Whatever that is. <laughs> After witnessing one too many stupid moves on the interstate, 
My partner and I finally decided to buy a dash cam two weeks ago. The one that I bought included a 32 gigabyte micro SD card and adapter. I figured that I would need to clear out the card too often, so I tacked on a 126 gig micro SD, which also came with an adapter. I got them both and then sat down in the bedroom to unwrap the packages. My partner is in the living room watching soccer, which is only important because he's a witness to what happened. To note, he had just cleaned the house, so there wasn't any clutter in the rooms. The bed was made, too. The dash cam came in a box, and the extra SD card came in a padded envelope sleeve. I'm sitting on the bed, opening the goods up. Totally normal stuff. Everything was in the dash cam box. Both micro SD cards are packaged in a credit card shape and sized plastic, so great. Not easy to get lost. The 126 gigabyte one is also in some harder case plastic that's annoying to rip off, so I set the box down on the bed and grab my scissors. I cut out the 126 card and I put it in the bigger dash cam box next to the other card so I can go install this bad boy. I grab my keys, double check that I didn't leave anything but the plastic trash on the bed, and go to the car. In the elevator, I'm just mindlessly gazing at the box so I know the cards were in there. Nothing remarkable happens when I exit the elevator and walk out the door to the parking deck and to my car. I don't trip. Nothing falls out of the box. It's a very simple and straight 200 steps to my car. I open the car's passenger door, set the box down on the seat, and pull out the power cord and the cam itself. I find the slot for the micro SD card, and then look down into the box to grab the still wrapped in the credit card sized plastic SD, and they're gone. Both are gone. I take out every piece. I even took the directions manual out of the sleeve and shook it and flipped it in case the card slid in there somehow. Maybe I could explain one card getting lost, but both? I purposefully didn't fully unwrap them so they wouldn't slide around the box and fall out. I ripped my car apart and I felt crazy. I looked under the seat between the console and seats and the side door pocket, the drink holder, the floor, under the mats, under the tires, the back seat, which I didn't even open to begin with. I shut the door of the car and I retraced my steps. It's a straight shot from the door to my car. The parking deck is flat and a light gray concrete. It's 11 a.m. on a bright Sunday. There's no dark shadows or weird corners where things could slide, and there's no one parked near me either. There's nothing in the elevator. Nothing in the small hall between my apartment and the elevator. I don't bump into anyone, which isn't unusual, because there's only one other person on our side of the building and she's 67 in a homebody. And mind you, it's been 15 minutes, so... Maybe they got dropped in the elevator somehow, and someone took them, even though I literally looked at them and know that they didn't. It's also a Sunday, and my building is not busy at all. Back inside my apartment, I go to the bedroom and search through the plastic and cardboard trash. There wasn't much, but it was evidence that the cards did exist. I checked the bubble-padded envelope. Nothing. I've got the receipts in the case that I cut the 126 card out of. I searched under the bed, under the pillows even. I grab my partner for help, and he looks all over along with me. Nothing in or around the hall tree where I grabbed the car keys. Nothing under the doormats. He searched between the car cushions, the glove compartment, even the sunglass holder. It's been two weeks. I thought if I just forgot about them, they would show up somewhere dumb and obvious, and this would be a haha, look what I found on the corner of the couch by the bedroom door type thing, but no. I looked there. He did too. 
so I'm still mad. I got glitched out of two micro SD cards and adapters and had to spend another $10 for a new micro SD so I could use the dash cam. One morning, I got up at my usual time to prepare for work. Since the COVID epidemic, I now work from home. On this particular weekday, I walked my dog that morning so he could use the bathroom, and also so that I could check my mail at our community's central mailbox location that sits next to our community pool. I collect my mail, and I notice that I have a key inside that is normally placed there when you have a package to collect from one of the otherwise empty mail containers. The name on the package wasn't mine, however. The address listed on it was my address. So, as I walked back to my house, I decided to drop it off on the neighbor's front porch whom I believed it most likely belonged to, and with that thought, if it wasn't theirs, since it had my address on it, they would return it to me, and then I walked home. I started work at 8 a.m., and around 9 a.m., I get a knock on my door. My ring doorbell recording showed that it was a man, who was empty-handed, that had rung the bell and also knocked on my door. Although I couldn't answer the door because my job involves customer service taking phone calls all day, I smiled to myself thinking that the box I dropped off was indeed left at the right house, and the person wanted to thank me. I gave myself that little pat on the back for a job well done, and I, after all, had made the right decision. At 9.40 a.m., I go outside and make sure the neighbor from earlier didn't set anything on my front porch, and then noticed my planter had fallen over and was sitting upside down in the grass. I swooped it up, set it back down where it should be directly across from my ring doorbell. My day then goes on as normal, and around 2.40pm, I go outside to pick up a small parcel that the Amazon delivery man had placed directly below my ring doorbell. I picked up the Amazon package, and looked into my planter, and was startled to see sitting inside of it was the box I had dropped off earlier that morning at the neighbor's house. Well, I guess I didn't drop it off at the right house after all, I thought, as I picked them both up and took them inside the house. I started to feel really annoyed as I walked into my kitchen to set them both down because now I would have to go to the post office over the weekend so it could get to the right owner. I was fresh out of ideas of what else to do with it. I set them both down on my kitchen counter, and I got back to work. After work, I walked over to the kitchen counter and was shocked that the only package sitting there was the one from Amazon. I couldn't believe it, and it took me a few minutes to process that it really was not there. Where did it go? Now, I was completely befuddled because I remember bringing it in clear as day. I checked my ring doorbell for my timeline, thinking I had just had an alternate reality experience. The ring doorbell recorded the neighbor from this morning knocking on my door and then leaving. It also recorded me picking up the planter and setting it back down. Empty. Next recording showed Amazon Man dropping off a package. Lastly, it showed me open my door, pick up the Amazon package, bend to look into my planter, and it audibly heard me say, Who is this guy? on the recording, suggesting that I really did see this box sitting there. There was no way it was just in my imagination. Yet, the recording does not show me picking it up or bringing it in. So, if I had indeed just left it outside in the planter to be dealt with later, it wasn't there after work when I checked. My ring doorbell never recorded anyone dropping it off, nor did it show anyone taking it off my porch either. 
I don't know what the significance was of that box on that particular day in any of the parallel universes of mine, except that, in all of them, I was destined to get it and deal with it. I do have other alternate reality experiences to share, and maybe someday, one day in the future, I will do just that. Approximately five years ago, one of my co-workers at my old job didn't show up for her shift one day. The next time we worked together, I asked why she had called out the other day. We just so happened to be in the presence of one of our supervisors, and we were all standing close to the entrance. She told us that her house had flooded because her younger brother left the faucet running right before her family went out to dinner. They came back to the house being mildly flooded. Unfortunate, but not too crazy of a story. The next day at work, me and the same coworker and the same supervisor were standing in the exact same spot as the day prior, close to the entrance, and we were all talking. I asked my coworker how her house and family were doing. She asked me what I'm talking about and why I would ask that. I said because of her house flooding, and she became very visibly upset and bothered, and demanded to know how I knew that her house had flooded. I became very confused, and asked does she not remember telling me literally just yesterday. She insisted that she didn't tell me about her house flooding, and demanded to know how I found out this information. I was bewildered and convinced that she must be messing with me, because she 100% told me and our supervisor about her house flooding. I turned to our supervisor and him like, didn't she tell us about her house flooding yesterday? Expecting an obvious yes in response. However, our supervisor said she had no idea that her house had flooded. It's the first that she had heard about it. I'm stunned into almost silence, and am incoherently babbling trying to explain that she definitely did tell us. My coworker cuts me off and says, There's absolutely no way you could have known about that. I haven't told anyone about my house flooding aside from our general manager. Not even, insert another coworker's name here, who is also her best friend. And if I haven't told her about it, why the hell would I tell you? She literally looked at me with disgust and stormed off. At that point in time, I'm still convinced that it was some sort of elaborate prank, and I asked the supervisor who witnessed this whole thing about it, and she still maintained that she was unaware about her house flooding. This disturbed me greatly, but it's just so insane that I was still convinced that they have to be messing with me or something. So, anyway, the next time I worked with Flooded House Coworker, I said hello to her and she just glared at me in response and walked off. After that day, it was never the same. We worked together for another six months or so and she continued to avoid me. She was rude to me when we did have to interact and treated me as if I was some stalker creep that was obsessed with her. I swear on my life that she told me about her house flooding. I remember it very vividly, but her reaction to me knowing was so intense, I really don't think she was faking that. My supervisor also maintained that she never actually told us about it. I even talked to her best friend about it, who also said she had not previously known about the house flooding. Her best friend told me that it was best to just leave the topic alone, and to leave Flooded House Girl alone altogether. I have no explanation for this, and when I tell people about this situation, they just tell me I'm crazy or making it up. I don't know how to explain it. I don't even believe in parallel universes, but 
I don't know what else it could be besides a switch up in my timelines. I don't know. <laughs> it haunts me, though, and I think about it all the time, and it just makes me feel sick. So, I'm going to try to keep this short, but it's really been freaking me out. I recently traveled across the country, stayed for two weeks, and then I returned on Sunday. I was visiting my boyfriend, and we had a very emotional departure. I always pay extra for window seats on planes. I love to be able to watch out them. So, I board the plane and the window seat doesn't have a window. It's just the plain wall. I was aggravated, but I brushed it off. I was very emotional, and I ended up falling asleep on the plane. I woke up suddenly and had no idea what time it was, where in the sky I was, how much longer I had on the flight, or how long I had been asleep. I felt very wrong. And, like, something was just... incorrect. I almost felt scared and definitely confused. I land, I get picked up by a friend, I stay at her house, and I felt sort of out of place, but I just chalked it up to me being gone for two weeks. I eventually went downstairs to my room, and I instantly felt that something was different. It didn't seem like it was my room. Almost like it was someone else's and I was just in it. I was very emotional, very tired, and I just wanted to unload my bags, so I ignored it. A few minutes later, I went to plug in my phone charger, and the outlet was in the wrong spot. I have my bathroom door slash wall, and then my nightstand, then my bed, and then another outlet on the other side of my bed. I've always complained about how plugging my charger up in that outlet bends the cord as I have to pull it up on top of the nightstand to use it, as the other outlet has other things plugged in. The nightstand is up against the wall, and my bed is up against the nightstand, and the other outlet perfectly lines up to where it's right at the other edge of the mattress. But now... The outlet is between the nightstand and my bed, up higher on the wall to where it's above the mattress and by the pillows. It's a good three or four inches to the left. I know it's moved. I've even pulled up pictures and videos that have had my room in them, and the outlet is not visible in them, as it was behind the nightstand. I live alone, so it's not a matter of my furniture being moved and everything else is in the exact spot it's always been in. I have no explanation for this, and it's bugging me. Could I have slipped into another dimension or reality? Am I going crazy, or is there somehow a logical reason? Edit. Please, do be nice to me. I've never posted here before, so I'm not sure if this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I've gotten a lot more replies than what I thought I would, and a lot of these theories are really interesting to me, and I'm going to take the time in the next couple weeks to look more into them. No one was in my house at all. Child and his father were at his house the entire two weeks, and his father doesn't have a key or any other way to access the house. No one was house-sitting, and I don't think someone would break in just to change my outlet position. As for the pictures, I didn't mean I had a previous picture of my room slash that wall alone by itself. I was referring to pictures and videos of my son running and playing in the room, and I don't feel comfortable posting content of him here. But I have asked my child's father about it now, and he also agrees that it seems to be moved. As for my mental health, I was emotional, but not hysterical. It has crossed my mind that maybe I was jet-lagged, overly tired or stressed or something, but I've caught up on sleep. I 
don't feel stressed or emotional or anything now, and I could still clearly remember it being in a different spot than what it now is. Thank you all for replying, and I really appreciate both the logical and illogical answers and theories. I might have experienced a glitch in Walmart the other day. I've been racking my brain since it happened, but I can't come up with a reasonable explanation for what happened to me that night. First, let me set the scene and scenario for some context. Earlier that night, I was at my job closing up shop with my manager and a coworker who was a newer friend of mine. It was a pretty slow night for business, so we were just talking and goofing off while we were closing because we wouldn't have to deal with any more customers that night. My shift went by relatively quickly because I enjoy spending time with my coworker, and no annoying customers were coming in to bother us. Soon enough, we were gathering our things and clocking out, getting ready to leave when my mom sent me a text asking me to pick up two pizzas because we were having guests over. Of course, I obliged. She would pay me back, and I got to pick the flavor of pizza that we would be eating. I drove down the road for about half a block, pulling into the lot of the Walmart superstore and parking. I remember smiling to myself because I had managed to snag a great spot close to the entrance, so I wouldn't have to walk in the sub-zero temperatures of the northeast. I got out and ran into the store, locating the frozen pizzas right by the entrance. I took a mental note of what flavor I would pick up, and made my way diagonally from the front left side of the store to the back right, because I needed to pick up some cheap paints while I was there. On my walk over... Nothing seemed wrong or out of the ordinary. Everything was in perfect order. Arriving in the far right corner where the paint was located, a blue fluffy blanket with a majestic unicorn print caught my eye. The blanket was on a shelf with various other blankets with images of other wild animals. All of the blankets were wrapped up and held together with a thin cardboard package displaying the image of the blankets on the front. The reason why I walked over to these blankets in the first place was because I bought my mom a blanket from Walmart with the image of the Virgin Mary for Christmas as sort of a joke gift. I wanted to take a picture of this unicorn blanket to show her because I thought it was hilarious. I approached the shelf with the blankets and I faced towards them. I was standing about two feet away, just staring at this unicorn blanket. I was frozen in place, in a trance-like state, fixated on the blanket. I had zoned out, something I frequently do, when a flash of bright purple light snapped me out of my trance. The light was bright like a flash from a camera, and it lasted for about three seconds. I whipped around to see if someone had taken a picture of me, but there wasn't a single person in sight. I looked all around, even peeking around the shelves, but there wasn't anyone close enough to have taken a picture or ran and hid without me noticing. I looked up toward the ceiling to see if maybe it was one of the store cameras that flash as you pass by, but there wasn't any of those either. Plus... Those make a loud dinging noise when they flash, so I would have heard it. I stepped back and forth trying to recreate what had happened, but I was unsuccessful in all of my attempts. I even walked away for around a minute and precisely recreated what I did, but that strange light did not appear again. I briskly walked back to the front of the store to get the pizza and leave. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. So today, I went back to the same Walmart to do the exact same thing. This time, 
a friend came along just in case the light appeared again, so I could prove to myself that it was just something in the store that had caused the light. But no results. I honestly cannot think of what could have possibly produced this light anomaly. This happened when my cousin and I were teenagers, probably around 15 and 16 respectively. Many members of my family were staying overnight at a hotel after the wedding of another family member. My cousin actually thinks it was for a different person's wedding, but that detail doesn't change the story. I was not one of the people staying the night at the hotel, but... I had some time to hang out and have fun with my cousin before my parents were coming to pick me up. We didn't have a lot to do, and we tended to be kind of mischievous when we hung out together. We never did anything crazy, just average dumb kid shenanigans. So, essentially, we decided to just walk slash run around different areas of the hotel, exploring, getting snacks, etc., my cousin remembers us knocking on the door to random rooms and running away. At one point, we noticed a middle-aged man in the same hall as us, who was wearing nondescript clothing and had on a tool belt. We tried to act natural as soon as we spotted him, but I'm sure we weren't very convincing. From this point, every time we turned around a corner and checked behind us, this man would be following us. He never yelled at us or said anything, and he never moved at a pace faster than an average walking speed, but it was extremely clear that he was following wherever we tried to go. It freaked us out a lot because we obviously didn't want to get in trouble, plus the dude had a weird energy with his silent, casual walk. We were panicking pretty hard after a few minutes of this, so our plan was to get in the elevator and quickly choose a random floor a few levels up, so that the guy wouldn't know where we went. When we got in the elevator, he was walking toward us from our left side, so when we were inside and turned around, he would have been coming from our right side, and he was maybe a hundred feet down the hallway. We go up at least three or four floors, turn left out of the elevator, and start fast walking in that direction. Within ten seconds of us getting off the elevator, the same guy rounds a corner a little way down the hall, and is now walking towards us. I distinctly remember saying, that's not possible, out loud to my cousin, as we were rushing back to the elevator. After that, we actually went to the front desk and told the lady working there that we were being followed, and when we described the guy, she told us that he worked there. We spent the rest of the time hidden in a little nook next to the lobby area, where we could stay blocked by a bookshelf. At one point, the tool belt guy did come into the lobby and we saw him talk to the lady at the desk before leaving. I was 100% convinced at that time that I had just seen something completely unnatural and not humanly possible. Even if the guy could have gotten to the elevator to see which floor we'd gone to, there's absolutely no way I could think of that he could have gotten up to the same floor from either a staircase or a different elevator in time to be walking at us from the opposite direction than he was coming from before no more than 10-15 to 15 seconds after we'd gotten out of the elevator. It's always stuck in my mind as something weird, but over the years, I started to write it off as an overactive imagination due to how scared I was in the moment. Then, I just saw my cousin when we hung out over New Year's, and she brought up the hotel and how the man had been following us through the halls. Once she mentioned it, I started to say that, at the time, I thought he had traveled an impossible distance in an impossible amount of time while following us. 
and before I could even finish recounting the exact scenario, my cousin was nodding that she remembers it too. I'm still not sure what to make of the situation, but it's definitely the weirdest story that I have. I literally just posted here, but writing out my story and reading all of your posts really has me reflecting on my glitchy experiences. When I was in college, I was a banquet worker at a hotel. One night, we were hosting a wedding and ran out of trash bags. We couldn't find any anywhere, so my boss asked me if I could track down a room service cart and grab anything that I could find even if it was small. At this point, it was almost 1am, the wedding was winding down and the hotel was quiet. I didn't have access to the room, service, closet, slash laundry, as a banquet server, so I was literally just going floor to floor hoping someone had left their cart out. Finally, on the sixth floor, I saw a cart at the end of the hallway. I could hear a baby crying, and I saw one of our hotel-provided bassinets in the hall next to a closed room door. I had to pass the bassinet to get to the cart. It was empty, as it should have been. As I got closer, the crying became louder. It made absolute sense to me. It gave me a nicky feeling in my stomach, but I thought nothing of it. The baby must be in the room crying and the parents parked the bassinet outside because they decided not to use it, right? I raided the cart for the roll of bags and noticed that the cart belonged to my friend Juana. She had an Aerosmith sticker on her cart, so I knew it was hers. The next day, I saw her at work and mentioned that I had stolen her bags and apologized because she had probably had to hunt some down at the beginning of her shift. I then jokingly thanked her for leaving it next to the bassinet slash baby room, and joked about how unsettling it felt to be in an empty hotel corridor next to an empty bassinet while listening to a crying baby in the wee hours of the morning. She was like, that's weird. I cleaned a room on that floor at the very beginning of my shift. I took the bassinet back down to the rollaway storage room first thing yesterday morning, the family checked out before you even got on. We discussed how unusual it was to have more than one family with a baby request a bassinet so close together. Especially on the same floor. We rarely had to dig out the bassinets. As I was leaving and clocking out in the laundry room, Juana stopped me to tell me the bassinet should not have been there, and that no other families had requested one, we have a checkout sheet for bassinets and rollaway beds, so that if we need one and we can't find one, we know where they were the last time they were used. Sure enough, Juana's room was the last one to have a bassinet. The sheet showed another coworker checking it out for the family when they arrived, and Juana checking it back into the rollaway room over 12 hours before I saw it in the hallway. I guess technically she could have forged her check-in signature, but there's really no reason for her to have done that, and she clearly recalled returning it to the closet. Regardless of whether or not the bassinet should have been there, the crying baby definitely shouldn't have been. The family had checked out earlier, and had been long gone before I went hunting for a cart. As a child, I used to entertain this fantasy. I'm assuming the majority of people space out from time to time. However subtle or severe the semi-unconscious occurrence is presented, it's both unique to the individual and similar to the experiences of others. With that understanding, you can also identify the feeling of snapping out of it or the moment when the zoning out ends and the alertness returns to leave you asking yourself, where was I? 
And how long was I there? To put it broadly, as an adult, it is more so an avalanche of thoughts that I can actually recollect. But as a child, it was more like waking up from a nap. I used to imagine that when this would happen, that the whole world was being paused. Everyone and everything was motionless, unaware, and unable to sense this pause the world over. It may have lasted a couple of seconds or a whole day, but everyone experienced it simultaneously and snapped out of it at the same time, then continuing about their lives without noticing. Everyone except me, of course. <laughs> I grew up in southwest Michigan slash northwest Indiana, and my family has 200 acres in Knox, Indiana, Toto Road for reference, that we use mainly for hunting. We hunt mornings and nights for two weeks straight when deer season arrives in November, only making occasional trips to town for necessities or dinner at a restaurant some nights. This leaves afternoons wide open for hanging out and doing absolutely nothing. One day, when I was 16, me and my cousin were talking and playing catch with a bouncy ball out in the drive in front of the cabin after the morning hunt, and we were probably about 75 yards apart. All of a sudden, he stops and turns around. He looks confused, and after about 30 seconds of watching him turn in curious circles, I started shouting something along the lines of, What are you doing? He started walking towards me, looking around quizzically. He got close to me before his bewildered gaze was then focused on me. He whispered, do you hear how quiet it is out here? I laughed at how serious he came across at first. I was imagining something much more urgent seconds earlier as he approached me, but his demeanor ceased to budge, and without words demanded my full attention to his question. We stood there and stared at the ground. It was quiet. A quiet like I've never experienced before or since. This wasn't just quiet, this was an absolute absence of sound. As I realized he wasn't just joking around, my hair stood on end from the top of my head and I got chills through my arms. Indiana is flat. You can hear cars and trucks from a mile away out in the country. When there's no cars around, the air is still filled with the noise of cicadas, birds, leaves in the wind. There was no wind. No wildlife, no motion to the surrounding area whatsoever. The universe, in this moment, was unnervingly still and lifeless. So much that the leaves and the trees were frozen in time, you could have heard a pin drop in the sand. And this persisted, and we stood there exploring this moment for five minutes tops, not moving a muscle, let alone speaking and interrupting the pure silence. As quickly as it set on, a gust of wind that started weak and grew in strength gave way to a truck rumbling in the distance, and the familiar hum of insects and leaves rustling all around us. And this was perhaps even more unsettling, as the noise made the silence feel all the more real. This story is 100% true, and I would like to know if anyone here has experienced anything similar. I posted a while ago about a glitch while working on Halloween where my ring apparently glitched off of my hand. Just yesterday I had another glitch and it's been bothering me ever since. I work in the photo lab at my job, and with the Christmas rush, I've been super busy with orders of all kinds lately. A lot of sales have been going on, so similar orders pop up one after another. In this case, there was a special for free 8x10s. I believe it was either Thursday or Friday. I printed a slew of them and was labeling them to be sorted into boxes to await customer pickup when I noticed I had two orders by the same person. A common theme with these types of specials. We'll say the name was Biggers, 
it was a very distinct name, hence why I remember printing it so well. I remember thinking, damn, I didn't realize there were two for her. I could have just put them in the same envelope. While I'd also gotten confused for a moment before wondering why I had two pictures by the same person, but couldn't find the label. So, I found the label, packed them up, and put them away. Among the other orders, I remember printing two orders of people with the same last name. It will call them Loud. L Loud and A Loud. They both had orders, and I remember them because they matched, and I see their names a lot while working. So, I packed them up, and I put them away. So, yesterday I'm at work, and Miss Biggers comes in for her orders. I have two, she says, and I reply, uh, Yes, ma'am, I remember printing them. But when I look in the boxes under the letter B, I only see one print. She tells me again that I know I had two, and I believe her and reiterate that I remember printing two for the reasons above. I go to check the printer and search the history, and only one order comes up. The one that I found. I go to the computer and search customer history. These never get cleared, so there are orders from a decade ago listed on there, and even if an order is cancelled, they aren't deleted, only labeled as cancelled. But there's still only one order on there. Unable to figure out what happened to the other order, I tell her to just resubmit it, and I'll honor the sale and end of conversation. I figure it's just a fluke, until Mr. Loud comes in. I have one for L and one for A. Yes, I remember them. Except I only find L's photos, not A's. He insists that there are two orders and I know that he's right. Like before, I check the printer, I check the computer history. Absolutely nothing. These orders apparently never existed. I tell him that this just happened earlier... I play it off as a system error and tell him to resend them and we will honor the free price. When the manager who was present while I was working on the orders originally comes in, I ask her if she remembers those names and how I printed multiple ones. She says yes. I tell her that they apparently never existed and aren't anywhere in the system. She's as dumbfounded as I am. I've experienced weird things in the past that I joked were glitches in the Matrix, but this is crazier than anything I've experienced, and it baffles me. I could explain the ring glitch right away, but I cannot explain this one away. I regret not asking for order proof from the customers like emails or order numbers to see if there was residual leftovers. Hi folks, I'm here to share with you something that just happened to me. I'm 19 years old and I have a girlfriend of the same age. She is an amazing person, and I can't put into words how much she helped me during 2021. When I'm with her, I feel like I'm the best version of myself, even if I'm not perfect. We've been helping each other out in numerous situations since we started dating... And that's one of the reasons we are so close. That's in the fact that we've been friends for ages. Unfortunately, some stuff has been going on with her family. I won't go into detail because I respect her privacy. That said, she is definitely not at her best right now. She's already going through a lot and her relatives keep fighting over her attention. Like kids. None of this has anything to do with me, but I'm here to support her as she did for me before. After Christmas, I decided to take her to a hotel so that we could de-stress and stay away from home for a little bit. We went to a place that is famous for having units in several cities here in Brazil. I booked a nice room, and we spent a great day together. However... Something weird happened with the elevator of that hotel. Twice. We got there at around 1400. I checked in, and I took the elevator to the top floor. 
Our room was 967, and the elevator dropped us off to the left of it. We got in, and everything was fine. And we talked about what was happening with her life, and things were getting progressively more fun, as we were both starting to relax and enjoy the moment. At around 1900, after taking a shower, we decided to go out for pizza. There's a Domino's right next to the hotel, and she wanted to try it. As we were leaving, I noticed something odd. The elevator was on the opposite side as it was before. It was to the right of our door. We were both visibly confused. She was following me around, and it seemed like we were lost, which is awkward considering that the whole floor is just a straight line. Once we found the elevator... We both assumed that it was just all a big mess, which is pretty normal for my life. So, fine. And we got the pizza, had a great night, and an even better morning. As we were getting ready to go home, packing our things and all that, her mom called her. Once again, I'm not going to get into any details. I will say that her mom was an extremely unpleasant person on the phone and that made her feel uncomfortable, especially because I was there. And that was it. She now wanted to go home and fast. I noticed that, and we left about five minutes later, around 10.50am. However, that damn elevator was to the left side of our door. I couldn't believe it, and my girlfriend was visibly lost as well. That said, she had bigger things to worry about and simply didn't care. Once I tried to point out the oddity to her, she said that I was the one confusing her mind, and that the elevator was always to the left. I just said, okay then, and we left the hotel. Overall, it was an amazing night. The room was great, and I felt unbelievably comfortable during my time there. Me and my girlfriend also spent the New Year's Eve together, and things are getting better, I believe. However, this elevator thing is still on my mind. It didn't scare me. It just made me curious. First... I want to be upfront about two things that I know will make a lot of you skeptical. I smoke marijuana and I have schizophrenic episodes every once in a while. But logically, this doesn't rule out the possibility of this being some kind of glitch. I would have left these two details out, but I want to provide full context to be transparent, so please hear me out. Years ago, I had this Lord of the Rings ring, this cheap toy gold-plated ring that I had received as a Christmas present when I was about seven years old. From years of play and wear, the gold plating had worn off and the ring itself, being made out of cheap steel, had been bent a little bit and was full of scratches. The ring was just overall in a really worn out condition. I must have been in my teens, I'm now 23, when I clearly remember tossing it away along with all the other cheap Lord of the Rings rings that used to come on these bookmarks that you could just get at the bookstore. I remember literally throwing them in the trash. Fast forward to about four months ago, I had gone off my medication to my own detriment and was experiencing a schizophrenic episode where I was in a state of psychosis. There was a night where I was in my backyard and was putting my trinkets and some of my jewelry into this old Native American grinding stone that is in my backyard. This wheel-like stone with the hole in the middle. There was no reason for me doing this. I was just acting weird because of the psychosis. But I left all of these precious objects in there overnight. I wasn't attempting anything, 
and I had no expectations of what would happen. The next morning, I went to retrieve all of these objects, and with them I found the Lord of the Rings ring I had tossed years ago. It is the exact one, bent with scratches, and 99% of the gold plating has worn off. I have no explanation as to how this happened. I still have it with me now. When I found it, I was excited because it reminded me of my childhood, and it is now extra special to me because of this odd event. I really hope that my disorder and my marijuana use doesn't disqualify me. Yes, I was smoking a lot during the time that this happened. Actually, way too much. And I was in a psychotic episode, but in my teens, when I had thrown away the ring, I was not smoking, nor had my disability emerged yet. I'd been without this ring for years, and I definitely did not ever put it in the grinding stone just to forget about it for many years. Another weird detail, in conjunction with finding the ring, I lost this broken bracelet that I had put in the grinding stone the night before. Kind of like I traded one object for the other. By the way, my episode is over, and I am 100% back to normal now. Even in my clear state of mind now, this whole thing seems like an impossible event. But who knows? Maybe there's an explanation that I'm missing. But have any of you found things in an odd place you swore you threw out or gave away before? I think it's weird. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but it feels like it isn't. When I'm driving home from work, I tend to see the same cars. I know that's nothing unusual, people getting out of their jobs at the same time, going home or whatever, but the same black car, an Audi with its left headlight out, flies up behind me, going way faster than the residential speed limit. The speed limit is 45 to 50 miles per hour, and he's doing at least 65 to 70, stopping maybe a foot off my rear. He then stays a foot off of my car for a while, and then darts around me passing in a no-passing zone. I always do the speed limit, because my car sucks, <laughs> and I can't afford the risk of a ticket. The car then makes a left down a side street, so two miles down the road I go to make a left, and coming from another direction, on my right, an identical black Audi with its left headlight out cuts me off turning down the road that I just came from. I know these roads. I grew up here and I know every single side street, etc. It is impossible for that to have been the same car. Yet the year, make, model, and headlight out were all the same. The weird part was that the driver looked the same. I mean identical. White male, aged around 40-ish, clean-shaven, dressed in a long-sleeved blue dress shirt. I can give such a clear description because of how close he gets to the back of my car and how close he gets passing me. This happened on Monday, and then again on Tuesday, but Tuesday the second car didn't cut me off. I saw it in my rearview mirror making the left. Then, again, Wednesday, I made sure to get the license plate number, because later down the road, what was likely the first car was in front of me at a red light. On the Monday, it was on my left at that same light, and that's when I got the clearest look at the guy. He was very stone-faced, like a Vulcan, staring straight ahead, I made a comment out loud to myself sarcastically that the Matrix is getting really lazy reusing NPCs, so obviously. I mean, come on, the whole left headlight thing was a dead giveaway. 
Then, after he made his turn away from me, I saw eight different cars and trucks with their left headlights out. Eight in less than five minutes. It was like the Matrix was like, whoops, uh, don't look. It's not unusual. I just started laughing every time I saw one after the other. I said, holy crap, does it care that I notice, or was it listening to me? Why is it that stupid to expose itself more trying to cover up the glitch? Or is a living being outside the Matrix playing with us like lab rats? I stopped thinking about it because I was almost at my destination. As I get out of my car, I overhear a neighbor on her phone. She says, Oh man, my driver's side headlight is out. I don't know what the hell is going on with people like me, but I've come to the conclusion that if you notice a glitch and refuse to dismiss it, it causes more glitches and it calls attention to you. You know the saying, if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. I think that may be more true than people think. I've posted here before about welcoming in my friend's doppelganger into our house when I thought it was his twin brother. This is what happened with one of the same friends some time later. I hope that it fits here, and if not, my apologies. Again, my friend Jeff invited me over. He had moved to a new apartment and told me that he had met his new neighbors. He said that his neighbors... A man and wife were having a get-together, and Jeff was invited. Jeff called me up and invited me to the party, and I accepted. It was a BYOB, bring your own beer, so I ran to the liquor store and got myself a pint of Hennessy. I then went to Jeff's house, hung out with him for a while, and then we proceeded to his neighbor's. The one neighbor was a white, ginger, alcoholic male with a big dog. His wife was a white woman with brown hair, and we all were students at the University of Buffalo, which is known to be haunted. They lived in an off-campus house. After talking a little, eating a little, and drinking, we all moved to the living room to watch TV with the lights off. The married couple sat together, I sat by myself, and Jeff sat by himself, and we all watched TV in silence and drank by ourselves. After about five minutes of silence, the front door burst open very strongly like someone kicked it in. The front door is right in the living room where we were, In her is a college-aged white female. She had long hair, blue jeans, a regular shirt, and a purse and keys. She slams the door behind herself. She doesn't say anything to anyone, and quickly finds a seat next to me. I assumed that she was the friend of the neighbor's wife, and that I may have been hooked up on a blind date. Because she sat so close to me, I assumed that she was hooked up with me. We didn't talk, she didn't drink, but she just checked her phone like she was busy and watched TV. After about 10 to 20 minutes, things started to get weird and confusing. So, she is so close to me that I'm admiring her beauty and looking forward to talking to her. As I'm checking her out from the corner of my eye, I get a cold chill down my spine that I immediately ignore. But at the same time, she appeared to get the same chill as the hair on her neck started to stand up. She immediately starts to look around in a panic, grabbed her phone in her purse, stood up out of her seat in a hurry, runs to the front door, jerks it open, scurries out, and then violently slams the front door closed behind her. We were all watching TV and drinking in the dark, so I just kept drinking. I figured that either I spooked her out because of my energy, I was still freaked out from the doppelganger sighting, 
and maybe she got scared and freaked out, or she had forgot something and had to leave. The rest of the night was silent as I fell asleep on the couch. But the next day, I asked about that girl and nobody seemed to know what I was talking about. They didn't hear the front door slam open or closed when she came and went, nor did they see or invite anyone else over but Jeff and I. There was no girl. Now, I know what I saw, but I'm thinking, did I get a visit from an angel? Did time freeze, allowing her to come to me? Is my mind just playing tricks on me? I work as a part-time retail manager while going to school, and last Thursday night was my turn to close and count the registers. It was a relatively slow day, so we didn't have any cash deposits. We always keep $500 in the drawer as starting cash, so when I counted down both registers for the night, they were exactly at $500, as they were supposed to be. I double-checked the receipts to make sure there were no cash transactions, like normal, and proceeded with my paperwork. Nothing out of the ordinary there. Unfortunately, it was also my turn to open the next day. Clopin shifts suck in retail, and it's protocol to always count the registers before opening the store, even if you were the one to close the night prior. I counted register one, $500, as expected. I count register 2, and it reads 50250. That's odd. I must have counted wrong. I restart my counting summary and try again. $502.50. Huh. Must be wrong again. After three times recounting the register, I continuously get 50250. I'm seriously questioning my counting abilities at this point. Fed up, I unwrapped all the change rolls and proceeded to hand count everything again while keeping a handwritten summary of the counts. I count everything and add it all up manually to check it with the computer. All of the counts and calculations are the same. Still, $502.50. Finally, after counting everything like two more times, I just could not figure out where the extra $2.50 came from. For those that don't work retail, $2.50 is such an odd number to be off, because it can only happen if you're either significantly off on your coin counts, or the dollar bills and some coins. Since I counted everything at least six times, I didn't think that was feasible, so I set the $2.50 off into our spare change, and I told the closing manager to be aware of it. I just talked to that manager, and he said the counts for Friday were perfect, without adding the extra $2.50 that I found in the morning. Assuming that both of our counts are right, that would mean the register physically gained $2.50 while no one was in the store. Keep in mind, we lock the doors, and we set an alarm when we have to leave, and only me and the other two managers have keys and codes to enter without alerting the alarm company. Even if someone were to enter the store while it was closed, you need our manager logins to open the store and thus open the registers, and whenever the store opens or closes, there is a record of it. I can confirm the store was not opened on the computers that night. The only logical explanation I have is that my main manager came in and added it by opening it with the key. Only he has the register key. Me and the assistant don't get them per policy. However, he's on vacation and he sent me snaps of him on the beach on Thursday, so I'm sure it's not him. He comes back tomorrow, so I'll be sure to ask him, but I think I 
may have somehow stumbled upon an infinite money glitch. A few days ago, I was with my sister and we had just gotten home from the mall. I was backing up into my parking spot. We live in a condo, so it's a well-lit underground parking. And there's only a post on one side, and one other car parked beside me on the other. When my sister and I suddenly hear a loud bump and then a crunch, it sounds as if I had just hit something. From the sound of it, I knew the damage would have left a pretty gnarly dent. I instantly break and we both look at each other in shock. I asked my sister if it was me because I was genuinely confused as I did not feel the car jump in any way and I had done all of my checks. Checking my mirror, sticking my head out the window, glancing at the rear view camera before and as I was backing up. I knew I had ample room and the speed I was going did not match the sound of the damage we both heard. I was backing in slowly, of course. So now, I'm freaking out in tears that I had just hit this expensive Porsche and that my insurance was going to go through the roof. I put my car in park and I tell my sister to go out and check the damages. She's doing a complete 360 inspection of my car and the other car until I hear her shout that there's nothing. What? I get out myself and I check the Porsche first. There are absolutely no scratches or dents. I walk all around it, back and forth, thinking it's just a trick of the light, but nothing. It's in perfect, glistening condition. Not a single hair scratch, which I would have seen since it was a black car. At that point, I'm thinking that I might have hit the concrete post instead so I check my car, feeling for any scratches or dents, but I find the same thing. Nothing. Everything is perfect. I check if maybe something got caught in my tires that could have made that sound, but again, nothing. It was weird. My sister and I go back and forth, talking about how we were both definitely sure we heard the same thing, but we just kind of shrugged it off, thinking... It might have been another car in the garage or something. The following day, my sister has to go to her friend's house to pick something up. I tell her she can drive because I just woke up with another migraine, and since it's just nearby and a familiar way for her, she can use a bit more practice since she plans to get her G2 soon. As my sister quickly turns to drive out of the garage, I kid you not, we hear that exact same bump and crutch sound. Except this time, I feel the entire car slightly jolt as the side of the car hits and swipes the pole by the garage door. I tell her to pull up to the front of the building, and yup, there's a nice dent and scratch marks on the side. Pretty much the same damage I had expected to see a few days prior. So, could this be a glitch in the Matrix, or just an odd coincidence. Has anyone else ever experienced something similar? Please do share them since I'm genuinely curious. Since I stumbled on this topic, I've been searching my memory for weird things that might have been called a glitch. Now, Keep in mind that I'm generally a skeptical person. I'm open to the possibility, though, and I had a eureka moment when my wife brought up something that happened to me about 12 years ago when I was living in Japan. I was about 27 at the time, I think, and I was in the military and living on base with my wife and kids. One evening, I went out with my friends and I saw this amazing drop-dead gorgeous woman playing pool with her date, that was obviously not going well. We did eventually chat briefly through a mutual friend and introduce ourselves, but 
Besides stealing quick glances as she bent over the pool table for the rest of the evening, I left it alone. She was quite flirty with me, much to the joy of my ego. My friends, I was tempted. I was very tempted. Everything about this woman was my type, but that's okay. That's part of life and part of marriage. The trick is saying no. I think her name was Sarah. She was not drinking, nor was I. In fact, I was the designated driver. At around 11pm, I started taking my friends home. She left at the same time, and walked home to the building across the street. It was around midnight when I got home, and relayed the story of my evening to my wife before we went to bed. Yes, including Sarah. We're married, not dead. The next day, I'm out with my wife picking up some stuff for the house when we run into, you guessed it, Sarah. She walks right up to me, gives me a hug, looks at my wife and goes, You have the wildest husband. Holy crap, we were out until 7 this morning and I had to drop him off at your front door. I'm amazed he's so pulled together, that was an epic party. I tell her that I went home at the same time she did, that neither of us were drinking and that the evening was overall kind of dull for the both of us. She blushed and gave me this look as my wife glanced away. You know the look. And then she walked away. She then texted me, which I never gave her my number, and said, don't worry, I can keep a secret. While I did eventually end up striking a pretty casual friendship with Sarah, the night that she remembers is 100% different from the night that I remember. Talking to her later, she remembers people that weren't there. She said she wasn't on a date, and we spent the whole night getting handsy until we snuck off together and went partying out on the town before landing back at her place to go at it like starved bunnies. Me and my friends remember the same thing. I was sober, my friend Eddie introduced me to Sarah, she and I chatted briefly, but otherwise I went back with my friends and drove them all home at 11. They remember her being flirty with me when we met, but that was it. My wife still jokes about me going sleep partying after I went to bed that night, because it's still one of the strangest things that happened to us. Well, I guess I'm glad that at least in another universe, I have some serious game. This happened roughly seven or eight years ago, but I think about it almost daily. I was a young college student also working full-time as a waitress. My boyfriend at the time and I also worked and went to school together. I always hated driving, but I really loved my Cabrillo Volkswagen, so I would let him drive us to and from in my car. I remember this clear as day that I was wearing black leggings with tall black boots. I hadn't been keeping up with my laundry, and my last resort was to wear lime green socks that I had never worn before. They weren't visible to anyone else, but I prefer black socks. I only mention this because of the color, you can't confuse this with other socks. On a rare chance we both had the night off, we decided to go out and have dinner together. We had a great dinner, but... Both of us were just exhausted and decided to just head back to his place, as it was closer, to watch a movie together. I specifically remember driving us home that night, because he'd had some drinks, so I sucked it up and drove us instead. I rarely stayed at his place because I preferred my bed and whatnot. We were tired that night, it turned on a movie before getting to bed. I didn't bring a change of clothes, but what I was wearing was comfortable enough to sleep in. I do always sleep without my socks on, though, and I remember him laughing that they were lime green and not what I typically wore. Anyways, we fall asleep and I have to get back home in the morning to get ready for work. So I wake up, and I try to get him up as well. 
My boots were at the foot of the bed, but my socks weren't on my feet anymore. I remember falling asleep with them on. So I immediately think I must have taken them off in my sleep. I'm pulling the covers and sheets looking for them, because, like I mentioned, I can't stand the feeling of wearing shoes without socks. My boyfriend woke up and helped me look around. We look everywhere. Under the bed, between the bed, all over, and they're nowhere to be found. So, again, I suck it up and put on my boots with no socks. We head to the car. I give him the keys to drive me back to my place. As I mentioned before, I had driven the night prior, and I prefer not to if I don't need to. I open the passenger door, and right there on the floorboard are my lime green socks. I immediately asked him, Are you messing with me? How did my socks get in here? But neither of us had an explanation, and it makes absolutely zero sense to this day. I still and never will understand how this happened. It is kind of a silly story, but it makes me question a lot. I truly think that this was one of the glitch in the Matrix situations. I've been meaning to share this story for so long, so I'm glad there's a subreddit for this. And this happened when I was 16. My mother used to take my phone at night, and then gave it back to me when she woke me up for school the following morning. Every morning started the same. She would wake me up, I would go to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready, I'd come out and put on my uniform, she'd give me breakfast, and then I would run out of the house to catch the public bus. This is the important part. I would always take my phone in the bathroom with me. I'm the type of person who plans my day by the minutes. I knew I had to take my shower for X number of minutes, get out of the bathroom by X, leave the house at X to catch the bus. So, same routine. I was in the bathroom, and I remember it so clearly. My shower took way longer than usual, and instead of it being 7.15, the phone said 7.23. I remember rushing out of the bathroom as I was supposed to leave the house by 7.25 most days. I rushed and put on my uniform, and my mom followed me half out the house with my breakfast. I distinctly remember checking the clock before I left, too, trying to figure out if I had time to catch the bus, or if I had to take a car to school. The clock was at 7.28, so... I had time to catch the bus. It was a snowy day in January, and I also remember that vividly. The sky was gray and dark, and that's how it was every day. The streets were eerily empty. I stopped at my bus stop, which was on the side of a pretty busy street. But not today. No one was on the streets, maybe a car passed by once every few minutes. I started getting worried that I would be late for school, and that's when I looked down at my phone to call my dad to drop me off at school. It was 4.03 a.m. I was shocked. It couldn't be. I walked back home, and my mom was still up getting my other sister ready for school, and she was surprised to see me. I told her to check the time, and... To her surprise, too, it was 4 a.m. She started saying how she swore her alarm woke her up at 7, like it does every single morning, and we both looked at each other and swore that we saw the time. A 4 a.m. snowy day and a 7 a.m. snowy day looked the same outside, but I knew that I checked the clock enough times to confirm that it was 7 a.m. Regardless, we all went back to sleep, and I again woke up at 7. 
This time I made my dad take me to school, and the whole day I had my eyes on the clock. This incident never happened to me again, but I still have no explanation for it. This happened in the mid-2000s. My husband had bought a used pickup truck that had been worked on and souped up, as the saying goes. We called it his race truck. By all appearances, it seemed to be a normal truck. It ran fast, and I'm pretty sure we drove it for a while before noticing an odd occurrence. At this point in time, every morning during the week... My husband and I drove together to a place halfway between our jobs, where I would pick up my car at a friend's business and head east, while he continued north. It saved on gas. Most of our commute together was on the interstate. There was one spot in particular where something very strange happened every morning around 6am. We listened to talk radio during the ride, and several miles past a way station for tractor trailers, the radio would develop static and fuzz out. When it came back on, the previous minute of the broadcast we had just been listening to would play all over again, and then the broadcast would continue as normal. The first time it happened, we didn't think much of it. Just a crazy blip in the radio signal, right? And then it happened again the next day and the next, and on and on. Every morning, the static in the previous 60 seconds would play all over again. We thought it must be the radio station having issues. After a while, though, it went from being a curiosity to a downright annoyance. It was like having to do over a whole minute of every day. We couldn't find a rational explanation either, but... It was somehow tied to that truck. If memory serves correctly, I think it did happen with another radio station one time. However, it did not happen in any other vehicles or near any other way stations. It continued to occur like clockwork for as long as my husband owned the truck, but after he sold it, we never experienced the repeating minute again. That particular stretch of interstate does seem to possess some kind of time anomaly. It's like an inverse of Einstein's theory. For about a 25 mile stretch, which includes the way station, I have noticed the faster I drive, the longer it takes to reach my destination. Conversely, the slower I drive, I make it with time to spare. I've monitored the clock against my speedometer, and even allowing for morning traffic, this still bears out. My husband and I call it the time tunnel, and I've been on time to work many mornings thanks to this anomaly. Past that 25 mile range, however, it's back to the ordinary laws of physics, so you'd better step on it. So, yesterday we had a funny and interesting scenario that was most obviously a coincidence, but I love exploring the possibility that it was something more. Some background details. My wife is somewhat religious. She hasn't been to church in a long time, but prays every night thinking God is watching over, etc. Me, I just think there's some sort of greater entity out there. And whether it be God, aliens, or something else, we get into playful arguments about this, but that's a whole other story. My wife has a small business, and so, a couple of times per week, she has to drop a bunch of orders off at the post office to ship out. And my wife is approximately three months pregnant, but there's not really a bump or anything yet, so you wouldn't know it just by looking at her. So on to the story. Yesterday, we go to the post office, and I sit in the car while she goes inside. She apparently fell running up the stairs, but 
I was looking at my phone and I didn't see what happened. She caught the fall with her arms and hands to shield her pregnant belly. While she was inside, an older woman in a big van pulled up next to me in the parking lot. I didn't really notice her doing anything. She seemed to basically just be standing around outside the driver's door. Normally, people park and just go right inside, but she was just standing around. A few minutes later, my wife comes out and said to me, Dude, didn't you see me fall? The window was open and she said this to me while standing outside the passenger door, right next to the woman with the van. Within like one second, the woman said to my wife, Oh my god, I hope you're okay and instantly handed her two identical coins. The coins are basically like a penny with a cutout of a cross in the middle, and a cutout that was a small cross that fits perfectly. The part that we find weird was that there was zero hesitation from this woman. She didn't reach into her pockets or anything. She had the coins in her hand ready to go and responded instantly. After she handed off the coins... She didn't say anything and walked away toward the entrance. So, that's the story of how we were possibly visited by an angel yesterday. We semi-seriously think it was an angel, and that she gave one coin for my wife and one coin for the baby. I love talking and thinking about supernatural and glitchy stuff, so... Of course, this is a possibility we'll never rule out. <laughs> but thinking logically... I assume most likely one of two things is what actually happened. She somehow saw my wife fall, although I don't think she could have with the way the times lined up, and waited purposely for her to come out to give her the coins as a way of saying, bless you, or whatever. Or the woman just has a big collection of these coins and hands them out to random people during interactions. But what do you all think? Many years ago, I had a job with my friend taking passengers on short trips around a lake on two small passenger vessels. Now, this seems like a fun job, and it was, but we would each do around 30 trips a day, so we would look for different ways of making it a little more interesting to help pass the time. Now, on this particular day, my friend had brought his new laptop in to work, and despite the fact that we were working on separate boats this day, we decided that we could play a game of chess on his laptop. Which, if he left it on the key, every time we landed the boat we could take our turn before heading out on another trip. At this time, for me, touchscreen technology was still quite a novelty, and I was impressed how I could move the chess piece with just a slide of my finger across the screen. It seems pretty ordinary now, but at the time, it was still kind of exciting. It may have been the first touchscreen I had ever used when I think about it, and this was working really well at first, but after several hours whilst halfway through our third or fourth game, I got off the boat to see what move my friend had made, and contemplate my own next move, but after deciding what to do, I slid my finger across the screen the same way I had been doing all day long. Nothing happened. I tried it again, but still nothing. The touchscreen had stopped working. At first, I thought maybe I had accidentally locked the screen, but after several minutes of trying to unlock it, I started to worry that I may have just broken it by pressing it too hard, or maybe I had gotten the screen wet or something. I started feeling pretty bad at the thought of having broken my friend's expensive laptop, and tried to think of ways that I could explain what I had done. Later that day, my friend approached me and asked why I had stopped playing. I apologized, and explained how I had broken the touchscreen, and I offered to pay for it to be fixed. He looked at me with a confused expression on his face which certainly was not the reaction I was expecting from a person who had just had their brand new laptop broken. And then, he calmly explained that his laptop didn't actually have touchscreen technology. 
At first I thought he was joking, but sure enough, he was right. The only way you could move the chess pieces was with the keyboard, of which I had no idea which keys I needed to press, and in fact, I had to ask my friend to explain how to use them. It still puzzles me to this day how I did it, but now and again, when nobody is looking, I try to replicate the seemingly impossible act on other devices. But as you may already expect, it has not worked since that day I was playing chess down by the lake. A day that I will never forget. So, I moved here around seven months ago. My house is in a small square with eight other houses, all facing toward a small patch of grass at the front. The first day that we got the keys, we met our next door neighbor, Janet. She was standing outside her front door when we walked up to the house, almost like she was waiting for us. I see Janet a lot, and I speak with her often, and I'm sure she's a real person. I've even met her adult daughter, and I've seen Janet around the local area. A few days after moving in, a courier knocked and asked if I would take in a parcel for the people on the other side of the square. I thought it was strange that he had knocked on my door rather than someone closer, but I obliged. A man came a few hours later and asked if I had a package for that house number. I gave him the package, and the man introduced himself as Mark. I haven't seen him since that day. Other than those I've already discussed, I have never seen another person in this square. Even my next door neighbor on the other side, I've heard noises from them, but I've never physically seen them. I'm home six days per week, and my husband is home the other day, and neither of us has ever seen anybody. I can see all of their front doors from my house. Now, a week ago, I was chatting with Janet. I asked her how long she had lived there. She said 24 years. This is definitely true, because I have at least one mutual acquaintance with her, and they have verified this. I asked her if she knew any of the neighbors, and she said she didn't know any of them at all. Janet's so friendly and a very warm person, and she's very chatty, so it doesn't make sense for her to not know any one of our neighbors, at least casually. Now, you might be thinking that all the houses are empty, but this is not the case. The hedges at the front of the houses are all maintained. The windows are clean. The flower beds are looked after. Then, yesterday, I saw a man on the green. He was in the middle of the green and carrying a laptop bag. I watched him walk into one of the houses, and then an hour later, I saw him again, still carrying a laptop bag, and I saw him in the middle of the green and watched him walk into the exact same house. It really felt like a glitch. It was the exact same thing, twice. Tonight will be Halloween, and I was hoping to take my kids around the square trick-or-treating, and also use this as a way to see if any of my neighbors actually exist. Not one house has a pumpkin, or any decorations, which means it would be rude to knock on the doors tonight. I am honestly starting to feel crazy. So, this just happened to me, 45-year-old female and first-time sharer, a few minutes ago, and it really just freaked me out. I thought I would share it here, even though it's nothing like some of the truly bizarre accounts I've heard here before. Okay, so it's a regular Thursday morning. My daughter and granddaughter are outside enjoying the cooler weather that just came in, and I'm working on my laptop on a few things. 
I needed to print several pages for a transfer of title that I'm working on, and blah blah blah. So, anyway, I had two print jobs in total, about five or six pieces of paper. There was already paper in the printer, which is located right next to my laptop, and has the paper feed in the back so that I can very easily see it from my sitting position on my desk chair. So the printer is doing its thing, and I notice that the last piece of paper is being fed through the printer, and I'm thinking, cool, I had just enough paper in the machine for what I needed. Just for clarification, I had more paper to put into the machine if I needed to, I was just being lazy and was happy that I didn't have to get up to replace it for these print jobs. <laughs> so, I grab the pages and I look through them, making sure everything I needed was there, and print it okay. And when I look up, there's more paper in the back of the printer. At least another 20 pages. My jaw hit the floor, but... Then I remembered my granddaughter and daughter had walked in from the backyard, right by my desk, on their way to the living room. I was looking down at the pages I had printed, so I assumed my daughter saw it, saw that it was empty, and refilled it for me in 30 seconds. I had to ask her and my grandchildren, and all of them looked at me confused and said they didn't touch anything on my desk. My other two grandchildren were in their room playing, and hadn't even been anywhere near my desk. I am one thousand percent sure the printing I did used every page that was in the printer. I saw it with my own eyes, and again, I was happy that I had just enough for what I needed to print. So I guess that this was my first glitch in the Matrix. Nothing major, I know, but for me, it was really mind-boggling. Has something similar ever happened to anyone else? Anyway, thanks for reading this, if you do, and thanks to anyone who listens. This all took place just before the pandemic shut down the world. Lent had just started during the last week of February 2020, and I was looking forward to six weeks of fish fries at the church across town every Friday. Thanks to the aforementioned global event, and subsequent lockdown, only two of the six scheduled fish fries took place before the remaining four were cancelled. I went to the first fish fry of Lent after work on Friday, February 28th, 2020. When I arrived at around 5.30 p.m., it had already been taking place for an hour. As I stood in line to pay for my meal, I saw a 60-something-year-old woman taking order tickets and bringing food to people at their tables. I recognized her as Jenny, a longtime member of the church that I attended. I paid for my meal and was handed an order ticket. I found an empty seat in the dining hall sat down, and I waved my ticket. Incidentally, Jenny saw me waving my ticket and walked up to me. She greeted me by name and we exchanged pleasantries before she brings my order ticket to the kitchen. About ten minutes later, she brought me my food on a tray, and I proceeded to have a pleasant dinner. Throughout the evening, I saw Jenny go back and forth to the kitchen multiple times with order tickets and or trays of food in hand. In this glitch, it took place two days later. I went to my own church on Sunday morning. Following the service, I exited the church and saw Jenny at the bottom of the stairs, handing out church bulletins for that week. She greeted me by name just as she had during the fish fry, and then the following exchange took place. Me, Hello, Jenny. It was nice seeing you at the fish fry the other night. Jenny, nonplussed. The fish fry? Me. Yes, the fish fry at the church across town. I hope they raised a lot of money. 
The whole time I was there for dinner, it looked like you didn't even sit down or take a break. Jenny. The fish fry at... the name of the church across town. Me. Yeah, that church. Jenny. I haven't been to that church in years. The last fish fry I went to there was just before Dell's stroke. Dell was Jenny's late husband, who had died seven years prior in 2013. I haven't talked to Jenny since, especially when the lockdown began. If she hadn't been to the fish fry at the other church in years, then who was that person that I talked to that Friday? Okay, so this is the only glitch in the Matrix moment I can remember off the top of my head. But even it isn't as exciting as some of the other stories on here. And even though it happened like three years ago, I still think about it occasionally. In the bathroom, there is virtually always a small colorful plastic cup right next to the sink. If you want a small drink of water or to wash out your mouth after brushing your teeth. One night, I went into the bathroom to have a shower, and I noticed that the cup was missing. I thought it was a bit strange, but really thought nothing of it. Our shower is small and is detached from the bath. You can only get in from opening a glass door. Any Australians here should know what I'm talking about. The shower has a small dugout area that goes into the wall, which stores soap, shampoo, etc. Imagine having an inverse ledge, if that makes any sense, whereby it goes inside the wall rather than jutting out. This inverse ledge is the only part of the shower that can hold something raised above the ground. There is also always a towel or two thrown atop the glass wall, that isn't the glass door. So, I went into the shower to shower, and I remember the ledge being completely normal. I would have noticed the cup being in the shower because it would have been completely out of place and easily recognizable. As I was showering, I was either facing the inverse ledge or the glass wall with the towel, and suddenly I saw the freaking cup out of the corner of my eye at near my eye level, like 1.6 meters above the ground. I turned, and it makes a sound against the floor as it fell from out of nowhere. I just remember being literally stunned for like a minute and confused out of my mind. What makes this weird? One, there is no way the cup could have been in the inverse ledge, and furthermore, then suddenly fall on the glass wall side, which is on the left to the inverse ledge wall. Two, there's no way the cup could have been inside the towel or behind it, or something, as the towel was either flat or wouldn't have been able to hold the cup anyways. I did not interact with the towel as this happened. And third, there is no way the cup could have fallen from atop the shower walls as it had no way to balance on the top, and even if it did, it didn't look out of the ordinary. And that is my only experience that causes me to doubt my sanity. I don't think I've posted this before, but if I have and somehow forgot, my apologies. Boring, relevant info first. I was born in New South Wales, Australia. The capital is Sydney, and my hometown for the first two years of my life was a few hours drive north of Sydney. At the age of two, my family left New South Wales and moved even further up north to Queensland, putting us many hours in the opposite direction of Sydney, about 18 hours by car. Fast forward to 2013, and I meet a guy in Sydney online, and we start dating. He visits me the first lot of times, and then I went down there to see him. 
he decided to show me around the markets and other areas. Now, I'd never been to Sydney that I could remember, but suddenly assumed that I must have been because I remembered pretty much everything. The streets, the markets, the roads, I remembered it all. I also remembered riding the monorail, which was opened in 1988 and decommissioned in early 2013. Growing up, I always remembered the experience and my sister being with me while I was on it. It was such a clear memory that I never thought to inquire as to whether it actually happened. When I got back home, I told my mom about seeing everything again, and remembering riding the monorail, and how now it was no longer operating. My mom looked at me strangely, and told me that she had never taken me to Sydney, at all, and that while my family lived in New South Wales and moved to Queensland when I was two, there had never been a trip to Sydney. To this day, I have no idea how I knew my way around Sydney, or how come I remembered riding the monorail with my sister when my family says it never happened. For some bonus weirdness, to add to it, the guy I was dating was quite bizarre, and I ended up believing he was a spy. He had claimed to go by one name and to work in a particular place. Turns out, he had never worked there despite regularly chatting to me about his workplace and the people there in an animated way as if he had. He also claimed to be a schoolteacher under another name, and at one stage years after we had broken up, he appeared as a suggested friend on Facebook under yet another name, before that profile quickly disappeared. He also took regular private flights somewhere, with people he claimed had offered him money to play poker with, despite the fact that he wasn't actually much of a poker player. So yeah, that was strange. In October, I was driving on Snoqualmie Pass late at night, when a semi-truck drove through a barrier separating the westbound and eastbound lanes. No one was killed, but the truck was laying on its side across one lane, and between the three vehicles that had been hit and the debris from the barriers, both lanes were completely blocked. Traffic was stopped, and I was among the cars stuck on the pass with no clue about what had happened. A few hours later, they had enough of my lane clear, the one that didn't have a semi laying across it, that we were able to slowly continue driving. As we got closer to the wreck, we started to see the debris that had been moved to the side of the road, and eventually I was shocked to see an ambulance halfway over part of the broken barrier, with its front wheels on my side of the barrier, and the barrier completely crumbling around it. It had definitely been part of the accident, and had gone over the barrier. Not too far away was more of the cars that had been hit, and the sideways semi. I assumed that the ambulance had crashed on its way to help. I remember staring at it and wishing that I had a chance to take a picture, but I got several good looks at it. The idea of an ambulance being involved in an accident was crazy to me, and I just couldn't stop staring. I was on the phone with my mom and described what I saw, and also described it to my friends in a group message the next morning, before I had researched the accident. The next day, I went online to find out the story of what had happened, and reports did say that an ambulance had been involved, but when I saw pictures from the scene, I was surprised to see pictures of the ambulance on top of another car, not halfway over the barrier like I clearly remembered. I thought two ambulances must have been involved, and I asked about it on a Facebook post made by the department. The ambulance belonged to where they had reported the accident, and I asked if there had been two ambulances, and described what I saw. 
They commented back saying there was only one and suggesting that the ambulance I had saw had been parked in a gap in the barrier to assist with the accident. But I didn't see an ambulance parked in a gap in the barrier. I saw an ambulance with two wheels in the air resting on a crumbling barrier, pointing right into my lane as if it had crashed through it. So I'm still trying to work out what the heck happened. A sparrow flew into my screened-in porch today. Birds often find their way in a few times a year. There are two ways. Through a hole in the northeast corner, or through the open cat hole in the southwest corner. I opened our screen door and began the annoying job of trying to save a poor bird who was terrified of me. I noticed right away that it was panicked and worn out. A feather was sticking out of place on its head, and it was panting with its beak open. It escaped me repeatedly by slamming into the screen wall over and over, and began falling to the ground. I kept trying to shoo it out the wide open door to no avail. If finally, I got a black shirt and figured I would throw it on the bird and get it out the door that way. By this point, the bird is now only just hopping around the porch, under furniture and into cobwebs. It sees me and just runs the other way. I feel stupid because I'm only trying to help it, and I don't want one of our cats to get it, and it keeps getting away because I'm trying to be slow and gentle. Finally, the bird is taking a break right in front of me, the dead square middle of the porch. We are nowhere near either hole in the screen, and to get to the open door, the bird would have to fly or hop to my right. So here's the moment of truth. It's scared, about to hop away. There's nothing within a three-foot perimeter of the bird except for me. I say, you know what? Screw it and I beam the heavy shirt at the little guy. And I watch the lump where the bird was under the shirt it just go flat. I pick up the shirt, and I'm confused because I know for a fact that I got the bird under it. But I also knew that there was no bird. I didn't hear its claws hopping on the carpet, no wings flapping, and it didn't escape by me because I had just thrown a shirt on it. I would have seen or heard it. It was just automatically silent on the porch after I threw the shirt. And it was so bizarre that I saw the lump just kind of fall flat. I searched the porch and the shirt over ten times. I flipped furniture, checked outside the porch. I searched everywhere. No bird. It was the freakiest moment of my life and... Only I will ever know for real that it actually freaking happened. I'm going to read this TLDR because it's the best TLDR I've ever read in my life. Uh, TLDR, I yeeted a bird into another dimension by throwing an old shirt on it. This happened while I was in high school. I was driving my mom's car with my best friend in the passenger seat. On the drive home, there is this hill that my friend and I refer to as the hill at the end of the world. We live in a suburban but woodsy area. And this particular hill isn't very big, but the incline of it and the way it curves a bit just at the top makes it to where you can't see the other side really at all until the very last moment when you've driven over the top. Until that moment, it almost feels like you're going to just drive into the sky. Also, at the bottom of one side, there's a cute little cemetery, for whatever that's worth. On either side of the road, there's just light woods and some spaced-out little ranch-style houses in the distance. No sidewalk and no shoulder. There are cars driving in front of me, and in back of me as well, and also coming from the opposite direction. 
We were driving in the direction of the cemetery. I see the car in front of me crest the hill and disappear below my line of sight. Then, I crest the top of the hill, and just right there in front of me on the other side is a man standing calmly in the middle of my path, looking out into the woods. I had seen him so last minute that I didn't have time to react at all. No time to brake or even try to turn the wheel. We drove right through him. But then there was nothing. No sounds, no bumps, nothing in my rearview mirror, no evidence of anything being there at all. Traffic didn't stop, the cars in back of me drove as normal. I was so confused. I just stared forward, trying to process. My friend turns to me and goes, Did you just see that? I turned to her and said, Did you just see it too? We pulled over, cars still passing, and walked back to look. There was nothing. No marks or damage on the car. Nothing abnormal on or around the road. Just nothing. We tried to make sense of it. How could someone have gotten there in the space between me and the car ahead of me? Where would they have come from? They would have had to have sprinted out of the woods, and the man that we saw was standing calmly, almost daydreaming. So, what the hell happened? Sorry this is kind of long. I'm not sure where to post this, but I thought I would give this sub a try. So, a little background. I'm a project supervisor with a company as a third-party contractor, so when I go to different manufacturing plants, I carry my backpack with everything I need, including a small portable printer and a laptop. And this has happened twice now. The first time I just brushed it off, and it just happened again. The first time, as usual, I packed my backpack in the morning, and I get to the site and get my equipment out. And I'm missing the cord that connects my laptop to the printer. I distinctly remember coiling it up and putting it in the pocket in the back of the main pouch that sits behind my laptop. And it's nowhere to be found. I didn't go anywhere besides home and to work that morning, and I only keep my equipment in one spot in our house. After searching all over at home and where my backpack was at work, I can't find it. Okay, whatever. I go home and order a new cord online. Then, it happened again two days ago. It's been a couple of months since it first happened, and the same events happened this time. Roll up the cord, place it in the same pocket, get to work, and no cord. Only this time, both the printer charging cord and the connecting cord are missing. I had rolled them up together. I look all over the place my bag is at work, just in case it fell out, and look all over where I put my bag when I got home. No cords anywhere. There are no holes in my backpack and I've taken everything out of my bag and searched, and no luck. My bag has only been from home to work and back. I'm completely clueless. I don't know if this is some kind of glitch, or just bad luck. But they seem to have just disappeared out of thin air. Nothing else has come up missing, and both times the bag hasn't been out of my sight. And I have a routine for my equipment so nothing is out of the ordinary. I feel like this time, I'm just going crazy. <laughs> I even had a coworker look as well. Has anyone else had something like this happen? I, I guess I'll order more cords, but this is just weird to me. I set off to pick my girlfriend up from work after being at my dad's. I entered the motorway, 
and there were only a few cars on there with it being Sunday at 10.30pm and really cold out. Anyway, like I said, I entered the motorway and after being on it for around 5 minutes, I see a car behind me. No car on the left or right lane, and I'm in the middle. As I'm looking at the car, I see it vanish. It couldn't have turned off at an exit as I passed the exit, and there were none for a while. I look ahead and back, thinking it changed lanes. I check the lanes. Nobody there. It was like I was driving up a hill and lost sight of it, but there were no hills. I was on a straight motorway. I did see signs saying salt has been laid down, and it got me thinking, was it a guardian angel telling me to stay in the same lane, or was it a glitch? This happened around two years ago, but since then other things have happened. I would say a certain word, and hear it on the TV a few seconds later, or talk about something, for example, cars, and bam, a car advert would come on. This has happened a lot of times, so do we live in a simulation, or is it just a bunch of coincidences? Anyway, I would love to hear all of your thoughts on this. Thanks. Alright, I'm new to this sub, so please excuse any mistakes I make, but this has got me quite freaked out. So, I'm female, 21, I'm a line cook who works a night shift, so I wake up relatively late. My alarm goes off every day at 12.40pm, and today was no different. I woke up and started the usual morning routine, keeping track of how long I had to get ready with the analog clock in my bathroom. As I'm heading out the door, I pack my Switch, the console, into my bag so I can play something on my lunch break, checking the battery level as I do. Right next to the battery gauge is the time, reading 1.20pm. All is normal so far. I head out the door, and I get in my Uber to go to work. Things get weird about 15 minutes into the 20 minute drive when my phone started going off in my pocket. I pull it out, only to see my 1240 alarm was going off. It took a second for the confusion to set in, but when it did, my first thought being, wait, did I wake up too early? Wait, no, my alarm? Huh, wait, what? My next move was to figure out if my phone, for some reason, was in a different time zone by texting my coworkers who scheduled to come in an hour before me. Succinctly, no, not at work yet and not running late either. Then I started googling when daylight savings time kicked in. Stupid I know, but I was confused as hell. So I wound up chilling out in a Starbucks a few blocks away until it was actually time for me to come into work. But I'm still shaken. Hopefully this doesn't become a daily thing. <laughs> I got onto Route 17 South by the Riverside Terrace. I had to wait on the on-ramp as a tractor trailer pulled into the gas station behind the RT. I passed two slow cars, and then I pulled into the slow lane, which is rare for me. I left them behind, nobody was in front of me as far as I could see. I was 25 seconds, I estimated, from the bridge by the Suburban Caps sign that is always lit up. Only it was off, which is odd. All cars are far behind me coming from the Sheridan Mawa area. I pick up my phone, Center Console 2011 Yaris. I check it for one second for messages, check the time, 9.48, check the car clock, same. As I set my phone down, 
the view alters to bright outside my car. I thought that I teleported to somewhere sunny, but it was just bright lights. I was now in traffic, with cars right on my back end. Me driving slow lane with cars on my back does not happen, ever, and a tractor trailer in the lane to my left and front. The road that had been curving slowly left was now curving hard right, and I was going under bridges. My lane peeled off, and I figured I'd get off here and figure out where I teleported to. If it was 17s, I'd know the exit. Well, it was the turnaround by Mawa Sheridan, bringing me back to 17S. I checked for missing time, 9.48 still on both clocks. Then I drove back past everything that I had just driven by moments earlier. The suburban cap sign was still out. For years, I thought that I teleported, but it makes more sense that I swapped place with another me that day. And after I got home, one outlet in my house had moved several inches from where it had always been. It was weird. I'm not entirely sure how much of a glitch these might be, but I thought you might find my story at least a little interesting. Raven has read my ghost stories as well, so it seems my life might have been more interesting than I ever thought, but of course, this is normal to me. I grew up dreaming about the future. And I don't mean it would be the next day, I mean a few weeks in advance. When I was little, there was no sound at all, I couldn't hear anything, but I would see myself doing things... And then a week later, I would feel myself doing it. Feeling this overwhelming feeling of doing this before. Deja vu. When I was ten, I started to gain sound. I remember the first deja vu tied to it. I was dancing in the bathroom, singing and laughing. I remember I stopped dead after and looked at myself in the mirror in shock. I had already seen this, and heard all of this. I was just very confused and realized I'd heard all of it before, which was also very new to me. I remember walking home from my friend's place, pissed off and muttering to myself, and I stopped dead on the sidewalk. I remember everything I said I had said before. This fight had happened before. Though we had never fought over this same thing before, and I didn't normally get so mad that I muttered to myself. This has never gone away. I've even had it happen while talking to Raven about things that we've never talked about. And I do mean the music or the video that's playing in the background. Brand new videos, I might add, are all playing as well. I now see it as a sign that I'm on the right path. Nothing bad happens after, so it's not a foretelling of something ill. If any of you have had this happen, I would love to read what you have in the comments. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Raven, for reading. first time posting here, but I'm ridiculously puzzled, and I need to tell someone that won't think I'm insane. I went to bed last night, after staying up and watching the ball drop. I read for a bit, took my dog out, and then I went to bed. Before going to bed, I realized that my apartment was a bit of a mess. Clothes on the floor, a few dishes scattered around, some plastic wrap left about from Christmas and I planned to clean it all today. My dog and I went to my room, locked the door, and went to sleep. For context, I live alone in a second-story apartment. I have security cameras on my front door and back balcony, and also have a doggy cam pointed at my dog's crate in my bedroom, 
and then also has my bed in frame. I rewatched the videos from last night, and there was no movement beside the usual stand up and stretch my dog does, and me tossing and turning a bit in my sleep. But when I woke up and walked out to my living room, it was clean. Clothes were picked up and in the washing machine, not running or full. Dishes cleaned and put away in the cabinets. Plastic from the Christmas presents thrown away. Everything was back in its usual place. And I've been trying to figure out what the hell happened. I have no history of sleepwalking, and the camera would have picked it up, and no one came into my house. I just can't figure it out, so... I wanted to see if anyone has any kind of explanation, or has experienced something like this before. To add, the CO levels in my apartment are fine, there's no evidence of any kind of cast leak. Downstairs neighbors had their detectors checked too, and it was fine. I'm pretty good at keeping up with my annual doctor visits and have screenings fairly often. Cancer, heart, and thyroid issues run in my family, unfortunately but I'll make a note of it to discuss with my doctor if anything else happens. To address some of the questions and comments that have been left, I do not drink or take any recreational drugs. Any meds I take, I've been on for over three years with no issues. I have cameras and lock my bedroom doors because I'm relatively young and I live alone. I also have a legal background and understand the significance of evidence if anything were to ever happen. 